Good evening, councillors, staff, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the briefing session. Uh, if I just take this opportunity at the start of the meeting to extend Mayor Roberts's apologies for this evening's meeting. Um, uh, we wish to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land uh, on which we meet, which we're meeting on, the Wajak people. Uh, we would like to pay respect to the elders of the Noongar Nation, past, present, and who have uh, walked and cared for the land, and we acknowledge and respect their continuing culture and the contribution made to the life of this city and the region. Mrs Smart, if I could ask you to please read the announcements. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Please note that the audio proceedings of tonight's meeting will be live broadcast online with the exception of matters discussed behind closed doors. That broadcast will remain available following the conclusion of this meeting. In regards to the current pandemic situation, the City of Wanneroo is committed to ensuring the safety of all attendees at public meetings. In accordance with the West Australian State Government Health Directives, social distancing has been applied to the Council Chambers and masks are required to be worn at all public indoor settings such as this meeting. Therefore, all attendees are required to please wear a mask at all times within this building, even whilst talking, unless evidence of a medical exemption has been provided. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mrs Smart. Uh, item one, attendances. Um, as per the record. Item two, apologies and leave of absence. We, and again, we have an apology from Mayor Roberts. Mr CEO, are there any other apologies? Uh, no, thank you, Mr Deputy Mayor. Thank you. We then move on to item three, deputations. Um, and just to uh, let everyone know this evening, because of the number of deputations that we have, unfortunately, each one of the deputations will need to be limited to no more than seven minutes. Uh, with that, we move to Deputation 1, um, which is on Item 4.2, the proposed scheme amendment number 203 to DPS 2 to introduce an additional use of office, strata lot 2-7 Printable Drive, Wangara. And the speaker is Mr John Hancock from Lansdale. If I could ask you to approach the lectern and state your name and address for the records. My name is John Hancock. My address is number six, Passive Trail in Lansdale. Sorry, yes, please. De Deputy Mayor, um, councillors, CEO, executive staff, thank you for allowing us to uh, make a deputation to this evening. Uh, in right, respect of agenda item 4.2, proposed scheme amendment number 203. My name's John Hancock. I'm uh, joined by my wife, Rosemary. Uh, together, we own, as of last Friday, uh, lot two at number seven, Printable Drive in Wangara, which is the subject of our uh, scheme amendment application. Our proposed requests, uh, proposal requests uh, council approval uh, to apply for an additional use zone to our strata lot uh, so that it can be used as an office, uh, which we believe is the only purpose for which the space can realistically be occupied, uh, just not really suitable for any industrial or showroom type activity. Whilst we're disappointed that council staff have not supported our proposal, uh, we thank them for including a full copy of our comprehensive scheme amendment proposal as per attachment two to the agenda item. I have had the opportunity to speak to a number of councillors in the past few days to explain our proposal. Um, those that I were unable to contact would have perhaps received an email from me as well. And I'm thankful and grateful for the time given to me in able, in able to, uh, to discuss this with us. Um, if you'd be so kind to uh, indulge me again, I'll just run through a couple of brief outlines about uh, our, uh, our proposal and the justifications and merits for it. For us, we, uh, we own Realty Force WA, a real estate agency. Um, we've lived and worked in the city of Wanneroo for many years, and uh, we've been operating from a small premise in Delamata Road, Wangara, for the last couple of years. Uh, last year, we started looking for larger, perhaps more modern, more prominent premises to operate from and to stay in the area. 
um, and continue servicing our clients, many of which are, are, are local in the city. Our search led us to a property for sale in uh, Prinderville Drive, Wangara, which is opposite John Hughes there, where he's just moved in. It's been vacant for many years. Uh, my best guess is six to eight years, um, but it's always had an, uh, a, um, a history of being occupied as an office. Other tenancies immediately adjacent to it and above it have also been office-based type businesses in the past. Um, we've been advised by city staff that um, an office technically can't be approved in the zone for our property, but rather than do what many other businesses have done over time, moving in and operating their business um, without proper approvals, uh, we decided that we would uh, make the application and engaged with the city planners and, uh, and Steve Marmion with the view to having the zoning change so that we can increase employment, grow our business and uh, fill up a tenancy that's been vacant for many, many years. Our, solu our solution simply was to apply for and include an additional use zone for the premises in, within the scheme uh, so that we can use it as an office for our business. Uh, there's many examples of offices that are operating at the moment within Wangara, um, and our proposal provided extensive justification for that. We're not property developers, nor are we trying to underhandingly change anything. Uh, we're just hardworking small business owners. Um, trying to do the right thing, particularly in applying for the zoning change rather than, uh, rather than not. We've used our hard-earned um, superannuation money to buy the premises. Um, we've engaged a consultant to uh, prepare the scheme amendment. We're members of the uh, Wanneroo Business Association, supporters of local charities in No Limits, uh, Perth. Um, and we want to stay in Wangara and keep growing our business. Um, we'd be most grateful, of course, for your consideration and support for our proposal, and we'd be happy to answer any questions that you have or for you to perhaps visit our premises uh, for a first-hand view. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Hancock. Councillors, are there any questions on this matter at this point? There being none, thank you very much. Thank you. Sir. Uh, we move then on to uh, the second uh, deputation, which is item 4.3, consideration of amendment number 199 to district planning scheme number two, following the advertising uh, regarding the permissibility of the car park land use in the general rural and rural resource zone. And the speaker is uh, Mr Matt Stewart from Meridjina. Mr Stewart, please, Do, can you just confirm your name and address for the records? Uh, my name's Matt Stewart and uh, I live in Woodvale and I'm representing a large number of landowners in the, the area of Neve Road development. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr Stewart. Um, so this is a scheme amendment to permit car parks on all properties within the entire general rural and rural resource zones within the city, a vast amount of land I thank the council for their time and sincerely list to sincerely listen to residents who are very concerned about the impact of this item and related items in the immediate future which will come before you. Evans Legal and Planning Outcomes WA represents the interests of nine landowners and residents totaling 100 hectares of land in the immediate area of the existing Neves Road car park. Exactly which owners and properties we represent, we are unable to disclose publicly because of there is a climate of fear from reprisals regarding the storage yard that the city is allowed to continue without any restrictions, even though it is illegal and prohibited under the scheme. But in summary, we support the facilitation of caravan and boat storage in the city as it is needed but we feel that it is grossly inappropriate without suitable studies, strategies and specific development controls. We therefore object to this item due to the manner in which it has been presented. <clears throat> Regarding vehicle types, 
this report and the report that preceded it and the reports for other relevant scheme amendments are all explicit and repetitive about the type of vehicles involved in these developments. They shall not be for commercial vehicles. But what is not mentioned in these reports is that the Council has adopted in principle only Scheme Amendment 172, which will change the definition of car park to strip the contents relating to private vehicles. Furthermore, the Neves Road development already has commercial vehicles in long-term storage. We have advised the city of this and nothing has been done to date. In addition, our submission was not, being, was not able to be included as an attachment to the city's report because of the privacy concerns, um, which is a shame because some of the content of our arguments is lost in the schedule of submissions. There is no mention or of comments and photos of a bus, heavy trucks and semi-trailers, flatbed tow trucks and a tractor forklift. The council support officers, however, have now provided you with a copy, so at the very least, could you please look at the photos? As a consequence, visual amenity and rural character has been destroyed with these vehicles and the massive bulk of 60 parked, well, proposed 60 parked caravans. While I do appreciate this item is not specifically for this development, surely the council can see that this type of development involves a real risk to the rural character and amenity of an area that requires planning study, strategy, policy, and specific scheme provisions. Regarding zone objectives, reading through the objections from the community, I'm struck by the volume of issues raised, and the summary is 14 pages long. A reoccurring concern is the loss of amenity that these properties um, should, should and these properties should remain rural in nature. In order for this amendment to proceed, the council needs to be satisfied that the proposal complies with the objectives of the zone, which are B, maintain and enhance the rural character and amenity of the areas designated for rural use. The city's report states that a car park, and I quote, uh, does not directly align with the objectives. The planning consultant's report states that, and I quote, the use does not enhance the existing rural character and amenity of the area. The WIPC have advised that, and I quote, this amendment presents various inconsistencies with state planning policy 2.5, rural planning. This should be concerning. <clears throat> But what is rural character and amenity? Um, these may seem vague uh, terms, and I see no analysis in any of these reports to guide the council in making a decision, despite this being a fundamental issue. I have strong ties to rural WA, and my folks have had farms and rural properties all their lives. My work focuses on tourism in rural WA. I also hope that some of the councillors have a rural background or currently live on rural or rural residential blocks. Um, agricultural and horticultural uh, activities aside, you live on rural land and uh, to have and care for animals, sometimes large ones like horses, to have big sheds to accommodate your hobbies and equipment, using ride-on machinery, chainsaws, to maintain the vegetation, tall trees, ring lock fences and star pickets that aren't visible from a distance, wide open spaces with uninterrupted vistas, and for many to find some peace and quiet. And we submit that what's being proposed here is the opposite of that. And quite frankly, I'm shock shocked by the number of caravans, food vans, buses, trucks at the Neves Road development in close proximity to residents uh, of a rural context and that the city think this, that this is okay. In my professional and personal opinion, what the city is doing here is destroying rural character and amenity whilst one, ignoring these One objectives. minute remaining, Mr. Stewart, thank you. So regarding development controls, so it, it seems that all properties can have a car park, no matter how narrow or small, localities that have a large number of dwellings and are special rural all, in, uh, all but none in name. So where are the studies, the strategies, the specific development controls that lays out setbacks suitable for a large number of caravans? Anything that protects the residents. 
And in this case, it would seem no, there is none, not specifically. But it's understandable that the scheme does not currently have effective development controls for caravan car parks because it's prohibited land use. And this type of development was ne never envisaged for this zone. So here we are introducing a series of scheme amendments and it's the perfect time to introduce development controls, but we're not. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Uh, councillors, are there any questions on this item? Thank you again, Mr. Stewart. Um, apologies to everyone in the gallery. I did, it was remiss me, I did not uh, read the uh, rules of deputation. I'll do that now. Um, go gently on me, it's my first night. Um, deputations must relate to a report on the current briefing session agenda. A deputation is not to exceed three speakers in number and only those speakers may address the council members. Speakers of a deputation will collectively have a maximum of up to seven minutes, depending upon the number of deputations received, to address the council members unless an extension of time is granted. A deputation is to be in the form of a statement and not debate or discuss on the matter is, no discussion on the matter is to occur. Questions from elected members relating to the subject matter should be reserved until the administration has presented to the relevant report during the meeting. However, a point of clarification from a CLEC council member on a specific statement may be permitted. There is an opportunity for the public question time uh, for members of the public at item seven in the business of order. And again, apologies, I should have read that at the beginning of the session. We move on to uh, the third deputation. That is on item 4.4, which is consideration of responsible authority report, RAR, related to the proposed shop liquor store, restaurant and office at 10 Enterprise Avenue, Two Rocks. And the speaker is Aileen um, Benkendorf. I hope I got that correct. Welcome, Aileen. Thank you. Um, if you could just provide your uh, full name and address for our records. Sorry. Uh, my full name is Aileen Bankendorf. Uh, my address is 17B Spring Hill Place in Two Rocks. Thank you. Um, so, good evening, councillors. Apologies. I wasn't planning on actually speaking this evening. I wasn't going to, I'm going to actually attend. Um, I suppose we represent a number of Two Rocks residents who oppose the development application, application proposing a Woolworths at the foot of King Neptune in Two Rocks. Um, the application was in front of the Joint Development Assessment Panel towards the beginning of March, and it's currently being deferred um, for reasons, I think, sorry, in relation to requesting further advice in relation to heritage matters from DPLH. Um, so we'd, we would encourage councillors to apply the guidelines in directions 2031 and beyond to inform their decision on this development application. In particular, we reference the Liverpool City strategy, which states that when sites are being developed, the quality of life of the community depends on not only the provision of infrastructure, but also the design of the community itself. It is vital that new communities be designed in a way that makes them accessible and easy to live in and that gives residents a sense of identity, pride and belonging. Directions to 2031 also recognises that the use of place planning principles will be important to ensuring that neighbourhood character and values are not lost or unnecessarily compromised by new development and that planning for already established communities protects the unique character of those neighbourhoods and develops a sense of place and the feeling of a belonging to a community. So just, just for clarity, if you are aware of the application and you know where it is, it is directly in front of the King Neptune statue, which is the former site of Atlantis Marine Park. Is everyone, yeah? <laughs> 
So we're asking that councillors keep these principles at the forefront of their minds when de deciding upon this development application for Woolworth directly at the foot of King Neptune um, and the fate of our little coastal town. At the outset, we would also like to note that while we understand that planning documents, um, specifically the ASP 17 and the DSP 43, only form a due regard framework, it is important to hold the developer accountable for representations made to the public in them. In summary, our opposition to this development proposal, um, uh, that, that it should not be approved on the following broad principles. One, it does not adequately address the heritage status of the King Neptune statue in the former site of Atlanta, Atlantis Marine Park. Number two, it does not appropriately address the best practice main street concept. Number three, it is not consistent with the retail strategy identified as coastal boutique or finer grain main street concept, which is stated in the uh, structure plans. It is also not consistent with the Two Rocks District Centre's function based on a resort tourism economy. It was recognised in the district structure plan that this district centre will be based on a tourism and resort economy, which is different to every other district centre. So number five, it substantially de deviates from the proposed land usage under ASP 70 as originally consulted upon. Number six, the relocation of the public open space from the middle of the subject site materially alters the intended purpose of the precinct. Number seven, a detailed area plan has not been considered and approved by the City of Wanneroo and should therefore not be approved. Uh, number eight, the public consultation in relation to the development proposal was not adequate. Number nine, it does not comply with the City of Wanneroo's parking policy. And number 10, that the traffic impact waste management um, and air quality have not been adequately addressed given the coastal location and prevailing winds. The first point that we, we make in relation to heritage um, concerns, you can probably have a look at the deputation that would have been provided to you. I, I won't read through the entire thing. Um, you know, if you're not aware of the history of the area, um, you know, it, it's a product of the 1970s resources boom, the Sun City Precinct. Um, T-Rex has a very rich history as the former site of Atlantis Marine Park, the Birdman Rally, a training ground for America's Cup Challenge and a Bond Corporation construction marvel. Amongst other things, for the past 40 years, it's continued to be the home to iconic Mark Labuse um, sculp sculptures, the most noticeable of which is the King Neptune statue. As we said, the Woolworths is proposed for at the foot of King Neptune, in front of King Neptune. So King Neptune now will be sitting and looking over the rooftop of a Woolworths building instead of the ocean or his dominion as the, the uh, god of the sea, right? Um, the Sun City Precinct still retains various structures in the Two Rocks Marina Zone and they continue to reflect the style and times in which they were constructed. Um, it is on the state, um, on the list to be assessed with the state heritage. Um, but it, hasn't, it has not been assessed yet. But it has been on there since 2003 and it's been sitting on the desk since 2003. So an important feature of the King Neptune statue is its sheer size and its ability to be seen from far away, but equally as important is the view from King Neptune himself. The context in which you view art or heritage is almost as important as the art itself. You don't put your favourite artwork in your toilet. One, moment, uh, one minute left. Thanks, Mrs. Beckin Be sure. Beckendorf. Sorry. Sure. Um, the current development plans for a, a great Woolworths building do not adequately address the unique heritage value of the King Neptune statue and surrounding areas. As the most prominent site in the Sun City precinct, particular importance should be placed on any development which sits immediately at the foot of the King Neptune statue to ensure that the development does not detract from its cultural significance. The next point I'd like to elaborate on is the main, main street retail strategy of coastal boutique and finer grain. So in um, ASP 70, the retail strategy and, um, and format for the main street is, is defined as coastal boutique and finer grain. What is being proposed is a large grey building um, and not find a grain in any way. It's definitely not coastal boutique. Boutique means small. It means small shop. It cannot be addressed through a colour scheme. 
it is the nature of the scale of the development itself. Um, if you think about uh, things like Margaret Ms. River... Apologies, Ms Finkendorf, that's, that's time. Uh, through the Chair, Mr. Mr Acting Chairman, please. Is it possible to seek leave for the Speaker to be given an extension, please? Unfortunately, because we have so many deputations this evening, Councillor, it's not going to be possible. It's not, it, it is because, impossible. Is that your ruling, sir? Yes, sir. It's impossible. All right. Noted. Thank no, you. because we have, uh, we have many deputations this evening. Apologies for that. Councillors, are there any points of clarification by way of questions on this matter? Councillor Baker. Uh, this question, I could ask the questioner. But I think she may be aware of the development, but paragraph two of the recommendation states, uh, and I quote, that uh, the city notes that administration at the time of presenting this report has not received any additional information from the Department of Planning, Lands and Heritage relating to the heritage matters. Now, the report, that paragraph says that as at the time of presenting this report, I gather this report was prepared on Friday last week or Tuesday or Thursday, perhaps. Just wondering if Mr Dixon could assist in advising as to whether, in fact, the city has, since the presentation or printing of this report, received additional information from that department regarding the heritage status of the King Neptune statue, please. Just before Mr Dixon goes, if I could remind Councillor Baker, the purpose of questions from elected members is to seek points of clarification from the presenters. No, that's a point of clarification from the presenters, not administration. That yes, well, debate I, and those I, questions I, I, I don't wish to dissent against your, your ruling again, but uh, I think the questioner is aware of a recent development whereby the city has in fact received a letter from the department uh, providing the, uh, the city with a status uh, uh, report concerning the status of the uh, heritage uh, listing assessment for the King Neptune statue. I think, I think the, the questioner may be aware of that. Yeah, yes, I am aware of that. Okay. And, and what's your understanding as to the current status? In other words, is the assessment simply ongoing? It's still in the back burner or has it been brought to the head I of the queue, please? I understand that there are a large number of um, sites that need to be assessed um, and there I suppose this one has been on the list since 2003 and has not progressed onto the list, um, onto the beat. I suppose every year they have a list and it has not progressed onto that list over that time. Not because it, it is not of, of importance. They have certainly recognised that the area is of importance, but it's because the, they have more urgent matters. So things that are, you know, decaying or at, I suppose, imminent risk of destruction or demolition or something along those lines. Mr Acting Chair, supplementary question related to the answer that the question I just gave. Uh, is it the case that the gist or gut, so to speak, of that recent correspondence advises that, uh, in a nutshell, it's highly unlikely to the extreme that the assessment process and any resultant decision one way or the other will be published prior to the reconvening of the JDAP hearing of the, applica the Woolies application, the DA application, which yeah, is scheduled so for another six weeks, I think it was four to, four to five weeks, perhaps? Sorry? I think, I think, I'm not sure the date of the next JDAP uh, meeting, but I, I, I understand that it's, it's actually been adjourned until a date in June. But in any event, by that date, the assessment process would not have been completed. In other words, the no, heritage the assessment, would not have completed yeah. its process, and as such, it would not have made a decision one way or the other. Yeah, the assessment process, from what I understand, would take at least 18 months. So even if it was put on the urgent list at this point, it would take um, 18 months for them to assess the heritage status of the precinct, including King Neptune statue. So unfortunately, it's one of those things where it's, it's time now to, to, to really place importance on that because we're not able to wait for 18 months for this development application on the decision on this development application. So we're asking you to take that into consideration when making a decision on this agenda item. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs Benkendorf. And uh, Councillor Baker, just for clarification on the point you raised with respect to questioning the ruling. Uh, it's um, rule number six, questions, and I'll read it again. Questions from elected members relating to the subject matter should be reserved until administration can present or has presented on the relevant report during the meeting. However, a point of clarification by a council member on a specific statement may be permitted. Just for clarification. Uh, thank you, uh, through the chair. And just to explain, by way of a personal explanation, uh, I take that I took that advice on board, and hence I rephrased the question and directed it to the questioner for that very reason. Thank you very much for your observations, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, Deputy Mayor. 
Oh, sorry, Councillor Miles. Yeah, I just wanted to ask Mrs. Uh, Blakenford, um, in light of the um, the petition and that that I think you you've supported getting together, um, have you had any meetings with your local state member? to try and address the heritage side of things, being that that's something that we have no control of at this level? Um, we certainly, I suppose, had support from, um, well, as much as he can, I suppose, it not being his portfolio, um, from um, John Quigley. Um, but I suppose in terms of whether there's much he can do at this point, aside from, I suppose, raising awareness of the issue. Um, I'm not sure there was anything he could do. I know that it has definitely been brought to the attention um, through our petition to Parliament, um, to the Minister for Planning and also the Minister for, for Heritage, who are all looking at it. But at this point, you know, we're very late on in the process. And so, unfortunately, there's nothing that can be quickly done by um, our state members or ministers at the moment. Thank you. No, Councillor Baker. As I mentioned it. earlier on, we have many deputations to go through. Just, thank just the no, you no Councillor Baker, thank you very much. No, just on a point That's, of order. No, Councillor Baker. On, on a point of order, a different subject matter on a point of order. So you're not permitting me to ask this question, an additional question, because the Councillor is Baker, too, I have too mentioned is before that, that, that we've had to limit the deputations because of the number, and I've said that on several occasions. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Councillors, we then move on to... Uh, Deputation 4, which is on the same item, and the speakers are Mr Steve Kelly and Mr Philip Griffith. Uh, if you could make your way to the lectern, please. And, of course, as you're coming down, stating your name and address for our records would be ideal. Thank you. Start. Please, yep. if you can state your name and address for our records, please. Yeah. Uh, Stephen Kelly, 11 Petha Road, Manning. Uh, yeah, thank you, for, uh, thank you, Mayor, Councillors, for the opportunity to present tonight. Sorry, just question. for the interruption, because this is actually being streamed. If you could move closer to the microphone, that'd be great. Yeah, OK. Thank you. Uh, presentations that I'll be covering, presentation topics that I'll cover will include uh, just a bit of the background, but main focus is on heritage and how our development responds to that. Uh, as a way of background, just in the handout there, you'll see that a heritage assessment was undertaken by Phil Griffiths, who's standing behind me in 2005, basically in assistance with the developer, Finney, uh, to identify uh, any sites of significance throughout the area. Uh, most of the categories identified as part of that assessment were threes and fours, which are on the local municipality with category two for King Neptune. The structure plan was then uh, developed acknowledging the heritage elements and subsequently in 2014 uh, adopted by WAPC. Uh, since then, uh, the Finney, which obviously they're not here tonight to present on that, but uh, they've completed a local development plan over, num over local development plan number one over Precinct, um, sorry, uh, King Neptune, uh, da, 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 sorry, the Dolphin, uh, Dolphin Island and the King, uh, the preservation, and it's basically it was to make sure the preservation of King Neptune, um, which is a park now that's a proposed park which has been ceded, as I understand, um, to, uh, to the Crown, about one hectares, a POS encompassing King Neptune and statues over where the celebrity clock once, once was, as well as $400,000 400, uh, bond uh, to the city of Wanneroo to construct the landscape, landscaping. The city, sorry, Woolworth site is immediately to the south of that local development plan area. Woolworth's proposed heritage strategy, so responds to uh, King Neptune Park. So King Neptune Park is immediately to the north. We maxim our development maximises views of King Neptune through the entry, uh, entry to the supermarket facing Azura Street. The built form shops fronts Azura Street, consistent with the town planning, um, the precinct plan, as well as the overall structure plan. The heritage impact assessment lodged identified that there was no impact on heritage to King Neptune. Um, in terms of our proposed heritage strategy, so well, I suppose we're a little bit um, 
uh, conflicted in terms of we've got the planning policy, which requires us to address the mainstream activation, which is consistent with the, the structure plan, uh, but we're also trying to address the heritage element, even though there's no uh, heritage requirement over the site, but that is through incorporation of statues and a heritage parklet, which basically strengthens the connection to King Neptune Park. Um, King Neptune itself is actually quite elevated, so you don't actually, it, there's no, there's no constrict, constraints to the sidelines. Uh, our design has actually undergone extensive assessment by the City of Wanneroo planning frameworks, including uh, extensive uh, review through the design re review panel. Um, and this site actually anticipates a supermarket being in this, in this location. And basically the nature of the development is in keeping with the functioning intent of the site. We have, uh, prior to JDAP, we have actually met with the community regarding concerns of impacts, albeit we hadn't done it prior to the application going into the system. The landscape design has been, uh, has now incorporated heritage elements, which are technically not required under the planning framework. Uh, we have met with a number of residents, um, requested feedback, although uh, this feedback has not, was not formally received. Uh, so in summary, look, we're not proposing, I think there's a few myths that are out there in the market. Uh, we're not proposing to demolish King Neptune. You can see on the summary page, um, uh, if anything, our design attempts to celebrate King Neptune. We have incorporated heritage strategy over the site through the heritage parklet and used to strengthen the connection back to it. Um, our design has undergone extensive review. Our existing BWS will be relocated. The site has been cleared. You can see basically from the works on site, it's been serviced and it's accessed, accessible. Thank you for listening. I'm available along with Megan Gammon, our planning consultant, to answer any queries. I'll hand over now to Phil Griffiths. <laughs> Terrific. So I'm Phil Griffiths um, from 315 Rockaby Road, Subiaco and I'm a heritage consultant. Um, in 2006, I um, did a heritage assessment for um, the owners of the land, recently acquired the Two Rock Centre. Um, and at that time, a summary report was released of my assessment, and that would have informed the uh, subdivision planning. Coincidentally, the City had looked at the individual places uh, throughout the Two Rocks um, Centre and had placed them in various categories of management for their inventory, uh, mostly category twos and threes and fours, mostly fours in fact. And um, in a subsequent review in 2017, downgraded all but the King Neptune stand, uh, statue in that um, context. Um, so that um, for this development... Um, Just one, mo one minute remaining, thank, thank you. you. For, for this development, we concluded that it was an acceptable outcome and that interpretation of the marine park on the Woolworth site was an acceptable way forward. I can tell you also that the Heritage Council wouldn't be interested in individual places, and if they ever do um, commit to assessing, they'd be assessing the whole of the two rocks precinct, including the marinas and so on. So in, in this context, the Heritage Council has no role to play and could not provide any advice. Um, happy to answer questions. Thank you, Mr. Griffiths and Mr. Kelly. Councillors, are there any questions? Councillor Baker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Acting Chair, through the Chair. Uh, just a question to either of you, either Phil or Steve, if I can, please. Um, of course, it's been noted that uh, back in 2006, some 16 years ago, uh, you requested by the owners to conduct, to, to conduct a heritage assessment of the subject parcel of land. Uh, have you been instructed since that point in time to conduct another fresh assessment of the subject parcel of land, please? No, everything we've done uh, to, is based on that assessment, so there's been no review of it. Thank you. Supplementary, Mr. Councillor Baker. Thank you, sir. Uh, yes, uh, on that basis, though, uh, assuming that the, some water may have passed over the bridge from that initial assessment some, of some 16 years ago, do you think it would be perhaps opportune at this stage, given the nature of your, your uh, client's DA before the JDAP, 
for a fresh assessment to be undertaken, given that there have been significant material developments in that whole precinct since 2006, 2006 some 16 years ago, please. I suspect that if I was asked to do it, my view would be somewhat dimmed because there's been a fair amount of fabric loss, if you know what I mean. So the cultural density of the site has been reduced. So the, the assessment may be slightly less enthusiastic than the first one. Okay. Further supplementary, fi fi Final question, please, Councillor Baker. One can I have two final questions? Final please? question, please, Councillor Baker. I don't want to repeat that we're tight on time. Thank you. Well, I, with respect, I don't believe we are. We've got plenty of time. This is a very important issue. But in any event, uh, I won't interfere with your ruling. Uh, yes, well, what, but more to the point, wouldn't you agree that that being the case, that now more than ever, and rather than running the risk of any future damage or loss to the heritage site, that now more than ever, the remnants of that site should be protected and it should be factored into, so to speak, the design plan, layout, scale, et cetera, et cetera, of your client's proposed Woolworth Shopping Centre DA, correct? Wouldn't you agree with that? Well beyond my remit, I'm afraid. Council, all right. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've only got one question in relation to um, Mr Kelly that you brought up during your deputation um, about what community consultation has been undertaken and what was the feedback that you received? Uh, I understand that there wasn't any community consultation that was undertaken by Woolworths prior to lodgement of the development application. The community consultation that was done was through the City of Wanneroo. Um, in February of this year, prior to JDAP, uh, myself, Alicia Jones, State Manager, met with a number of the residents, uh, including the previous speaker, um, to discuss you know, areas of concern that they had, um, which are very consistent with their, uh, with their convert, with the deputation, uh, and just requested really uh, to provide us with some comments um, to formalise it so that we could potentially respond. I find it's probably an easier way to do it than go through this sort of process where it's a, you know, you're arguing over, um, you know, the, I suppose the finer detail versus trying to create. And look, in hindsight, possibly it was something where there should have been some sort of consultation prior to, but we were trying to create, I suppose, some sort of relationship or salvage um, what was, um, probably not, sorry, probably uh, get the relationship or the trust back from the community a little bit, but we hadn't received any formal correspondence from them. Councillor, can Oh, sorry, I've got to keep it on. Um, I have two questions, if that's permitted. The first one, um, there's a lot of discussion in the reports about the view from Woolworths to Neptune and that you'd be able to see it and that's a way of acknowledging it and everything. But I have noticed throughout the report, you actually haven't included any superimposed pictures of how that would look. And the reason I'm asking it is because of the bulk and scale of Neptune and the height difference between Neptune is sitting on the ground and where the car park is. I'd lo I'm interested to see what the view would actually be. Would it actually just be the back of a palm that they're going to see, or maybe the crown, or will they be able to see the entirety? No, if you, if you go out on side, you'll see that uh, King Neptune sits, I'm not sure how many metres above, but essentially the rooftop, it'd be, you'd be able to see King Neptune from all angles. There has been um, um, side elevations that have been provided as part of the, uh, the development application pack, which do actually show um, the height, the heights of the building, the scale of the building, and compares that to basically any sight lines that may be obstructed, and there, there isn't any, unless you're sitting down on the bottom of Lisford Avenue looking up, well, maybe, yeah. maybe. And th and that's what I mean when we're talking about, you know, the view from possibly the coffee shop or the car park, which has been spoken about in the report. I just haven't seen that superimposed picture that would show that view that we're going to see from those places. I've seen yeah. the elevations of the buildings, I've seen what the street might look like, but I haven't seen what it would look like from the car park looking back. Um, oh look, it's probably uh, an image that we should have included within the deputation, um, but it is included as part of the development application. Okay. Um, it does actually demonstrate or show that the King Neptune is quite is elevated. All right. um, 
And the other question, if that's okay, is just in regards to the statues themselves, um, throughout the report, there hasn't been much mention of which statues would be used, and if they're being used from ones that are already on display in another public place, how that public place will be affected by the removal of those statues. Uh, we've been in discussion with Finney, and they, we understand that they have, and they've provided us with photographs of other statues that aren't within the public realm that are stored, and we're proposing to use those post-selection of the ones that we're after. So there wasn't proposed to be any poaching, I suppose, from around other parks or areas where they're on display. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Miles. <coughs> Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, my question, I think, would be to Mr Griffiths. Um, when you first did the site, I'm assuming you did a site assessment of the, the old park, um, it, just in general, what was actually left at that stage back in 06? Was it just the King Neptune or was there other uh, stuff on site? So there was the whole of the shopping complex, Neptune, and some of the megaliths and uh, bits and pieces of evidence of some of the ponds. But it was really a demolition site. But you could make out fragments of what was there when it was a functioning place. Councillor Baker. Thanks. To, thank you very much for permitting me to ask this question. Uh, my question is addressed to Steve uh, Kelly. Uh, and this follows on from Councillor Zingali's comments regarding the line of sight issues. Uh, looking at the concept drawings, of course, uh, the roof appears to be flat, but I assume that necessarily there will be a need for certain items or items of the plant and equipment to be located on the roof of the shopping centre complex, including satellite dishes, uh, commercial exhaust fans, air conditioning condensers, uh, sorry, air condensers, I should say, and also I think there's a requirement for some sort of, uh, if you like, for want of a better term, fencing around the perimeter of the roof. Uh, have you factored in the, the likelihood of those items being affixed to the roof of the proposed shopping centre complex and the impact that those items may have on the line of sight, so to speak, for uh, a person who was standing, for example, immediately to the south of the shopping centre complex looking uh, to the north uh, to view the King Neptune statue? And for that matter, the uh, vehicles travelling along the main road, Two Rocks Road, were intending to enter into that precinct. How, how those items on the roof could impact upon their clear vision or line of sight, un uninterrupted, unobscured line of sight as they travel or traverse that road heading north. Have you considered that, please? Uh, yes, um, predominantly um, you can see on the site plan that it does actually show the plant and equipment is located to the rear of the building, uh, so it prevents any, I suppose, uh, air conditioning, condensing units and and uh, other bits of uh, equipment up on the roof uh, for some of the retail, uh, specialty retail stores that do front of zero. It really depends upon the uses that intend on going in there. So it's hard to say whether or not there would be, but the intent is to have it all screened underneath the, uh, the parapets. Just one final mini sum, Mr. please. Councillor Baker, sorry, we really do need to move on because we are running behind. Um, so I think we've had uh, quite a few questions on this. Oh, hang on. Councillor Nguyen, you've had plenty of questions, Councillor. Councillor Nguyen. Um, once the site is um, developed and if you were asked to assess the heritage value of the site after that, how much heritage value is left um, after, say, the site is fully developed? If any is left. Shall I answer that for you? Um, basically, there's nothing of heritage value on that piece of land now. It's demolished and cleared, so the value wouldn't change. It will have shifted from the time I did my assessment, but development won't change that value any further. Thank you, gentlemen. I think that's all the questions we have. Uh, for you this evening. Thank you. We move on to the next deputation. In fact, the next uh, four deputations are all on item 4.10, which is consideration of the minutes and decisions of the electors' uh, special meeting held on the 15th, uh, 16th of March 2022. And the first speaker is Michelle uh, Kwok. Michelle. 
Name and address for the records, please. Um, Michelle Kwok, Crawford Elbow Ocean Reef. Um, Deputy Mayor, Councillors, I'd like to address officers' comments on the item uh, the, on decision two, three, four, and five from the um, special electors meeting. Firstly, the claim of the uh, uh, mandates um, being um, under the State of Emergency Act being an, a legal requirement. I'd like to remind Council that mandates are policy suggestions of the government and are subject to interpretation and application on a case-by-case -case basis. Page six of the Australian COVID-19 vaccination policy states, while the Australian government strongly supports immunisation and will run a strong campaign to encourage vaccination, it is not mandatory and individuals may, may choose not to vaccinate. Prime Minister Morrison and Premier McGowan have been clear in stating that employers cannot and should not mandate the COVID vaccines. Yes, this is conflicting information to claim that it's being a legal requirement. What shall we do in this case? It's very clear that the Commonwealth of Australia Constitution Act 1900 under Section 109, inconsistency of laws. When the law of the state is inconsistent with the law of the Commonwealth, the latter should prevail, and the former shall, shall to the extent of the inconsistency be invalid. Mandating vaccines violates Section 51, 26A of the Constitution. The provision of medical services and benefits um, not so um, as to authorise any form of civil conscription. It breaches employment laws and violates anti-discrimination laws as it constitutes as medical discrimination. It is in breach of the Equal Opportunity Act in 1984, WA, um, it's unlawful for an employer to discriminate against a person on the grounds of the person's religious or political conviction. Under the Disability Discrimination Act 1992, um, the employer must take reasonable workplace adjustment for a person to perform genuine and reasonable requirements of the employment. Mandates violate several federal laws, including Section 94H of the Privacy Act 1998, uh, 94H requiring the use of COVID safe um, in, in, in a communication device. Penalty could be imprisonment for five years or th 300 penalty units or both. Article 1 and 6 of the Nuremberg Code. Article 1, the voluntary consent of, hu of the human subject is absolutely co essential. The ability to exercise free power of choice without the intervention of any element of force, fraud, deceit, duress, overreaching, or other altruistic form of constraint or coercion. Article 6, the degree of risk to be taken should never exceed that determined by the humanitarian importance of the problem to be solved by the experiment. But the Biosecurity bio, bio Act 2015, force must not be used against an individual to require the individual to comply with a biodiversity, bio, sorry, biosecurity measure. Section 92, receiving a vaccination or treatment, requires individuals to be found to be an infectious person by a court before any restriction can be placed on the individual. Restrictions, therefore, are not designed to be applied to the population as a whole. The mandates, the, the Australian Human Rights Commission, the Fair Work Commission, Safe Work Australia and the Business Council have all declared that employers should not mandate covert vaccines. Internationally, at least 15 countries have turned away from mandating a trial vaccine and their courts have ruled it unlawful. Um, there ends the confusion about legal requirement. The second point of the report claiming um, vaccine mandate is, is in the best interest of public health and safety of our community. Um, please refer to the printout to see a uh, number of adverse reactions in 5 to 11 years old, page 19. Um, it's 883 adverse reactions in this youngster and at just over two months. Um, and also the last pay page has um, an ongoing community survey. 89% does not, of the businesses we did, does not think that mandate um, is actually keeping the community safe. Um, as we all know, children are not at risk of harm in contracting COVID, and neither does the average person. Therefore, we do not agree that vaccine mandate is in the best 
best interest of public health and safety of our community. In response to comment on council has no authority to override or create laws or take any action that would conflict with state or federal government legislation or health orders, Two things that will need to be demonstrated. Number one, the role of efficacy of local government in matters that are under the jurisdiction of the state. Number two, the role of local governments in public health. The role of efficacy of for a local government originates from the role of the council in the local government act. Section 2.1, elected members are to represent our interests to provide leadership and guidance to the community and in the district. Section 2.7, council is responsible for the performance of local government's functions. Um, the council can do all other things that are necessary or convenient to be done for uh, or in connection with performing this function. The local government has no jurisdiction in health matters and therefore should not perform an efficacy role is inaccurate, as you have done this before. The city of Wanneroo... One minute left. Thank you, Michelle. Sorry? One minute. Uh, okay, thank you. The city of Wanneroo is committed to creating environments that support our community health and well-being. To achieve this vision, you have developed the public health plan in 2014 for three years. This plan was about how we will implement strategies that would promote mental health and social well-being, developed in partnership with the Department of Health and community agencies across Perth. The plan reflects local health and well-being data, as well as the health priorities of both the state and federal government. The aim of the city's public health plan is to create a physical, social, economic and cultural environment that supports and promotes health and well-being for the whole community in line with a social de determinants of health approach. I agree with the public health plan stating that smoking, excessive alcohol consumption, lack of exercise, lack of nutritious food, obesity, mental health issues have to be addressed. The mandates are doing just the opposite to the above. Since the city of Wanneroo have done it before and have been an, in an efficacy position with both state and federal government, we desperately need you to do this for us, your community. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah, I was, uh, you've gone a little bit over seven minutes, but I didn't want to stop the enthusiasm. Oh, thank you. You're very kind. Are there any questions? Councillor Baker. Uh, thank you, and through the Chair. Thank you. Uh, yes, Ms Kwok, just one question. Yes. Uh, of course, uh, I've read your deputation notes, or written submissions, I should say. Thank you. And of course, what, what's at the very heart of these is this issue of uh, the eff efficacy or otherwise of vaccine mandates, I think you'd agree, correct? Uh -huh. uh, but in terms of determining or assessing the efficacy or otherwise of vaccine mandates, do you agree that it would help if the state government released all of its so-called expert medical advice that it allegedly has been acting on from the date upon which the, uh, the early onset, of the, the very first onset of the very first suggestion of the pandemic, all the way through to, uh, what is it, 7 p.m. tonight? Would it, would it be of assistance, do you believe, that, uh, that Sorry, medical information what? that advice was made public? It seems to be a tad secretive, I think. I think you'd agree. Yes. Do you agree that the medical advice should be released? Oh. And, and there was... Yeah, Councillor Baker, when, if you're speaking, could you make sure that mic's on? Uh, I think I speak no, because loud, we're on, if, if we're on air, Councillor. I don't really need a microphone, but anyhow. Absolutely. Thank Any you, further Councillor questions Baker. on this item, councillors? They're being on. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. We move on to the next speaker on the same item, which is item 4.10 on tonight's agenda. Uh, Mrs Linda Crawford, if you could make your way forward and name and address for our records, please. Hi, my name is Linda Crawford, Gouron Road, Duncraig. Good evening, Mayor and Councillors. Many of us are challenging the COVID narrative we see on the news daily for good reason. I will endeavour to highlight a few reasons here. For two years, we have been contacting politicians, state and federal, and individuals like the Chief Health Officer to no avail. That's why we are here. By focusing intense efforts on screening, quarantining and policing asymptomatic people, we have inadvertently diverted precious resources away from protecting the vulnerable and development of early treatments. Many of us have suffered trauma, and financial devastation as a direct result of these mandates. In 2020, there was a study involving 10 million people in Wuhan published in the journal Nature. 
they found the detection rate of asymptomatic positive cases was very low and there was no evidence of transmission from asymptomatic positive persons to traced close contacts. Dr. Peter McCullough is a board certified internist and cardiologist. He is a highly, he's highly published and has been used for US Senate testimony many times. He recently spoke at Senator Roberts' COVID under question cross-party inquiry. Dr. McCullough categorically stated, the virus is spread from acutely sick people to susceptible people. The virus is essentially not spread between asymptomatic people. And the only people who need to stay away from others are those who are acutely ill. There are many other conflicts of interest we need to take note of. The TGA is 100% funded by the industry whose products it monitors. It also has a role of both approving the drugs and monitoring their safety. Recently, the Informed Medical Options Party reviewed their data and found that all of the trials they used for assessments were from vaccine manufacturers. None were independent. In the USA in 1988, legislation was passed that no vaccine manufacturer shall be liable in a civil action for damages arising from a vaccine related injury or death associated with administration of a vaccine that was properly constituted. So our TGA is relying totally on big pharma studies from the US to prove safety when they are indemnified against civil action for damages. Dr. Judy Wileyman writes that over the decades, many members of ATAGI, including the chair, or sorry, have been chief investigators on vaccine trials representatives of vaccine advisory boards at some time and often received individual payments and there is no funding provided for vaccine trials or research that is independent of vaccine manufacturers. So who do we trust? We must place a great amount of trust in these vaccine companies and individuals involved with them. According to the IMOPS investigation, since the year 2000, Pfizer has been convicted of 75 offences and paid out a total of over $10 billion. They found AstraZeneca has been convicted of 26 offences and paid a total penalty of over $1.3 billion. Furthermore, the TGA states, it is generally acknowledged that adverse events are underreported around the world, with estimates that 90 to 95% of adverse events are not reported to the regulators. And for example, in the USA, fewer than 1% of adverse events are reported. So even if they do their monitoring job well, they will only be looking at 1% to 5% of the data. Dr. Tess Lowry is a frequent member of technical teams responsible for developing international guidelines. Dr. Lowry authored a paper published in August 21. They found that there was moderate certainty evidence finding that large reductions in COVID-19 deaths are possible using ivermectin. Uh, um, it may reduce numbers progressing to severe disease and the apparent safety and low cost suggests that ivermectin is likely to have a significant impact on the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic globally. In October 2020, Dr Hill, Andrew Hill, was asked to report to the WHO on dozens of studies around the world evaluating the use of ivermectin. He talked with Dr. Paul Marrick and Dr. Pierre Corey and Dr. Tess Laurie about the existing data that they were witnessing. And in early 2021, they shared data and agreed that ivermectin looked like a cheap, safe way to end the pandemic and needed to be rolled out ASAP. Dr. Hill then agreed to join her strong author team preparing to conduct a systematic Cochrane review. Dr. Hill found that ivermectin was associated with reduced inflammatory markers, faster viral clearance, and shorter duration of hospitalization. In six RCTs of moderate to severe infection, there was a 75% reduction in mortality.
But despite this, just days before publication, the paper appeared on a preprint server with its conclusions changed. It just now one, concluded one that more support. studies on ivermectin were needed before it could be recommended worldwide. Dr. Laurie has made a video exposing the truth about the suppression of ivermectin, and during an urgent Zoom call between Dr. Hill and Tess Laurie, he admitted that one of his study's sponsors, Unitaid, had a say in the conclusions of the paper, but would di not divulge any names. Later, Phil Harper analysed the PDF's metadata and found a name, Andrew Owen. As it turns out, Andrew Owen is a professor of pharmacology for the Centre of Excellence in Long-Acting Therapies. He's a scientific advisor to WHO, and just days before Dr Hill's paper was to be published, a $40 million grant from Unitaid, the paper's sponsor, was given to Kelt, of which Owen is the project lead. I'll skip the next section because we've had things shortened, but I'd like to just summarise by saying these concerns discussed highlight the need for accountability and transparency and the dangers of mandates. We ask you as our local government to stand with us and advocate for us in effort to achieve this. Where there is risk, there must be choice. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Crawford. Uh, we, and yes, we've... I didn't cut you off, just that summary was perfect. Thank you. Are there any questions from councillors? No, there are none. Thank you, Ms Crawford. Thank you. We move on to our next deputation, which is on the same item. And the speaker is Ms Angie Rayson from Wanneroo. Angie, your name and address for our records, please. Angie Rayson, Wanneroo. Good evening, Deputy Mayor, councillors, and everybody else here. This deputation is in response to the recommendation in tonight's agenda with regard to the four-part submission requesting that the council adopt an advocacy position st statement called COVID-19 Pro-Choice Statement. On the 16th of March, in this very room, you heard your ratepayers tell of their pain and suffering physically, financially, socially, and so, uh, due to the segregation and discrimination caused by the overreaching mandates. In today's media blitz, it is very hard to understand the full story with regard to the pandemic, the masks, the restrictions, and the so-called vaccine. When mainstream media is only providing one narrative which has a, has a very narrow view of here and overseas, it can be very difficult to understand why we are so passionate about our plight. To that end, I have put together a very short list of articles, documents and videos so that you have a starting point on which to do your research your due diligence in order to make a more informed decision. I direct your attention to the attachment that was provided to you as part of my registration process. There are 11 references which only skim the surface, but hopefully this will empower you to think carefully and look deeper. The first item, 150 plus research studies affirm natural acquired immunity to COVID-19, documented, linked and quoted. Analysis of 150 studies, that concluded that public health officials and medical establishments with the help of the politicalized media has misled the public with asserting that the COVID-19 shots provide a greater protection than natural immunity. Two, COVID-19 vaccines and treatments, we must have raw data now. The British Medical Journal has published this article advising that data should be fully and immediately available for public scrutiny. At present, pharmaceutical companies are reaping vast pro profits using adequate independent scrutiny of, with, sorry, without adequate independent scrutiny of their scientific claims. Third, 
on COVID vaccines, why they cannot work and irrefutable evidence of their causative role in deaths after vaccination. Doctors of COVID ethics confirm that vaccines can trigger self-destruction. Think about that, self-destruction. Four, Pfizer vaccine authorised data sight unseen. Doctors for COVID ethics have evidence from an FOI request to the Australian drugs regulator that approved the Pfizer vaccine confirms that they have never, never seen the study case. There's an interesting link in that article from a Sky News interview with the TGA head who says otherwise. Five, the dangers of the new NRNM, sorry, mRNA technology. Dr. Mike Eden, former UK pharma company research executive, highly qualified in his field. He speaks of his concerns. Six, a literature review and meta-analysis of the effects of lockdowns on COVID-19 mortality. Analysis of results which support the conclusion that lockdowns have little to no effect on COVID mortality. Seven, emergency management 2005. This refers that the local government authorities can amend, make amendments to the arrangements. Eight, Database and Adverse Event Notifications, DN, access to that register so you can go and have a look. As of this evening, number of re reports or cases, 117,669 adverse events. Number of cases with a single suspected medicine, 115,507 adverse events. Number of cases where deaths was reported as an outcome, 807 adverse events. Number nine, mask mandates and legislation. Office of the Public Defender highlights the discrimination of the no mask, no entry signage. 10, where is the line on COVID emergency measures? The Australian Human Rights Commission is concerned at the lack of transparency in explaining the continued justification for some emergency measures, and even for identifying which level of government is responsible for some measures. It's one minute remaining, Ms. Rayson. 11. We're coming for you. An address to the Senate from Senator Malcolm Roberts directed at the Australian vaccine stakeholders. There are so many other references for you to review. However, there are many, 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 many articles and videos documenting the ludicrous pandemic and the associated restrictions. Wake up and look. Look at the rest of the world, or even look further within Australia. Today, just today, hot off the press, Perth now. Restrictions did their job. Queensland to scrap vaccination mandates for pubs, restaurants and cafes within a week. Their Premier said restrictions have served their purpose. And Queensland's current number of infected as of tonight is 8% higher than WA's. At this point, I'd like to acknowledge all the people that assisted in collating and rent ranking the articles for the final list. I thank them one and all for their time and applaud their passion. Thank you, Ms. When... Rayson. That's unfortunately time. Thank you. It's any... a shame I can't finish the last <laughs> sentence, isn't it? Thank you. Please finish the last sentence. <laughs> When are your constituent, when your constituents are telling you when the ad advocacy electors meeting attendance was 10 times the average number of people, and this figure does not include many that were listening at home, me and my family. 
What are they telling you? Please listen. Thank, Thank you, Ms. Rosen. Oh, question. Yeah. <laughs> Councillors, are there any questions? There being none, thank you very much. Thank you. And the next um, deputation on the same item is from a Mr Ian Strover. Is Mr Strover here? Mr Strover, please. And again, Mr Strover, name and address for our records, please. Thank Ian you. Strover and Karamar. Firstly, apologies for my attire. I wasn't going to be coming till 20 minutes before the meeting started. Um, I'm not necessarily just going to read off a script, but uh, I just thought I'd let you guys know that uh, I've been dealing with a lot of barristers and solicitors around Australia, and I have emailed all the councillors quite a bit of their information. So rather than me just reading stuff, you can um, take it in yourself, which lists well over 20 cases and examples where local government, state government, Commonwealth government have all been sued for, for not doing these particular things. So, uh, so some of the key things I really want to point out is City of Wanneroo currently is actually offending the Australian Constitution. You're not defending it. I say that based... Um, because under the Constitution, Section 51, under civil conscriptions, it's prohibited to allow the state or a third party acting on behalf of the state paradigm to interfere or in influence the doctor-patient relationship. APRA have communicated a direction to medical practitioners which appears to violate this. Um, I won't go on with too far of it, but the Parliament could not pass a law requiring citizens of the states to keep their premises clean or to submit to vaccinations or immunisations because under this section 5123A was added to the constitution by the people of Australia through a referendum. Surrounding debates highlighted that Australians accepted that social, pharmaceutical, dental and medical benefits provided by the government were important for the collective good. However, they also recognised the importance of both the right to professional independence held by medical and dental practitioners and the right to personal autonomy in a doctor-patient relationship. So Section 51 guarded against the possibility of the reduction of these rights by the federal and state governments, which is against us at the moment. So this is the APRA directive. The directive states, any promotion of anti-vaccination statements or health advice which contradicts the best available scientific evidence or seeks to actively undermine the national immunisation campaign, including via social media, is not supported by national boards and may be a breach of the codes in conduct and subject to investigation of possible regulatory action, which means they get deregistered, which, which we've all heard of. But there's a couple of those documents. Another one um, I read a bit off last time, which actually goes on about your oaths and your liabilities and what you are required to do and how you are able to stand up um, to McGowan. Uh, there's a couple of questions I actually have for you guys without notice, so I do apologise. Um, obviously, both the Wanneroo Council and the Wanneroo Emergency Management Committee are deeply involved in COVID matters because it's such a threat to everybody. Um, and you're required to do this under the Emergency Act. I would love to know when this committee was set up, how often you meet, whether they're on all your committee meetings and how often it's discussed, and has the City of Wanneroo sought financial or other assistance on behalf of Wanneroo businesses affected by COVID? I'm a business and I can tell you no, so if not, why? Has the City of Wanneroo sought or assisted in seeking exemptions on behalf of certain classes of local residents and or local businesses from the State of Emergency Public Directives and Orders? If not, why? I'm entitled to one, no one's helped me, my business, which you're able to get exemptions for. Um, and as my learned Fred said over here, has City of Wanneroo made representations that vaccinations against COVID-19 are futile after McGowan's own admission that double vaxxed are only 4% protected? If not, why? That's all I've got to say. There's plenty of stuff for you guys to read, but 
there's plenty of information out there that contradicts everything he says. And as you said, he won't release the information. Why won't they even let all the legal information get out there? Thank you, Mr. Strover. Councillors, are there any uh, questions on this deputation? Uh, there being none, uh, thank you. That completes deputations, councillors. We then move on to item four, which is reports. Uh, Mr. Dixon, welcome. Um, over to you, sir. Uh, good evening, Deputy Mayor and Council Members. There are five reports from the Planning and Sustainability Directorate on tonight's agenda. I would like to briefly introduce item 4.2, and Mr. Barrowing will introduce item 4.4. Chair, um, item 4.2 is a scheme amendment to allow office as an additional use on Strata Lot 2, Prindeville Drive in Wangara. The site is zoned industrial under the Metropolitan Region Scheme and service industrial under our district planning scheme. Development approval was granted for 11 showrooms and 70 car parking bays in 1994. Notwithstanding this approval, five of the 11 units have been fitted out as offices without any approval for a change of use being obtained. In district planning scheme number two, an office is not capable of approval in the service industrial zone. It is an X use. The applicant in their submission has made numerous points in justification of the application which have been summarised in the report and you'd be pleased to know I don't intend to go through each of those in turn. Administration accepts that to allow an office use of this site by itself would have a negligible impact on the amenity and function of the surrounding area. Administration's recommendation for refusal of this scheme amendment is based on the planning principle of not allowing commercial uses on industrial zoned land. By allowing an office in this location restricts the opportunity for suitable businesses to be located there and potentially compromises the viability of nearby business and commercial areas. Supporting this amendment would set an undesirable precedent for Wangara and it would make it difficult to resist other such applications and it is the cumulative impact that would change the character of this industrial area and potentially detrimentally affect nearby activity centres where offices are encouraged to be. This report outlines that there is no shortage of land and buildings in the nearby area that are available for office use. Uh, Deputy Mayor, notwithstanding administration's recommendation if, recommendation, if Council is mindful to support this application, I consider that a preferred option would be to include the entire parent lot into the amendment area, including all 11 units and not just strata lot two. This would assist in regularising the office land uses in some of the other strata lots, noting that a future application would be required. Notwithstanding that point, a more strategic approach further would also be for the city to explore the option to amend district planning scheme number two to consider small scale offices as a discretionary use in the Wangara service industrial zone. Deputy Mayor, I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Dixon. Councillor Baker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, or Acting Chairman, or Chairperson. Uh, yes, just a question, Mr. Dixon. I think you'd agree, Mark, that throughout uh, Enterprise Park, Wangara, every business there, and I'm putting aside NGOs, every business, every business has an office inside it. I think you'd agree with that. Uh, that, that every business has, well, unless they operate from home as a home office, but normally there's a distinct area of floor which is set aside as an office, and the relativity between the office square meterage uh, area to the actual work area proper, of course, may vary. It could be 50, 50, 60, 40. I've seen some large buildings uh, in Enterprise Park involved in uh, what I've described as being heavy industry, where it's almost a 50-50 split, mainly because of the need for people to be working on computers, of course, uh, uh, and designing and fabricating 3D or using laser technology, uh, different types of uh, objects or equipment. So I think you'd agree that every business has an office in it. So, in answer to that question, I, I haven't surveyed every business, um, so I couldn't categorically define a, oh. an answer to that, but I think the point being that 
Ancillary offices to the main use is acceptable. Um, we're not disputing that. This, the issue here is whether it's purely an office. Um, so where there are businesses that manufacture uh, goods and they have an ancillary office accommodation, that is entirely appropriate and acceptable within the zone. Uh, supplementary, please. Councillor Baker. Thanks. I may have to ask a couple here. I apologise, sir. I know you're in a hurry, but I'll try and go as fast as no, I can. No, not in a hurry, Councillor Baker. Just, it's not deputations well, now. Thank you. No, we're short of time. Yeah, that's right. Uh, all right, sorry, uh, I apologise. Uh, yes, but once again, I think you'd agree that, sorry, uh, Mark would, uh, Mr Dixon, you'd agree that that relativity issue is, is a live issue. How do you characterise the primary or the use of a parcel of land? Uh, you look at the actual use. If there are many uses, do you characterise it by the primary use of the land rather than the ancillary? And how do you do that? It, it, can I get to a scenario, it can be a 50-50 scenario, whereby you cannot primarily characterise the use due to, due to that split, please. So, in instances of this nature, administration will look at the entirety of what is being used within the building. Um, the key point, I think, though, and I'll reiterate, is if there is an ancillary or an incidental office to support the main use of the building, industrial use, that is acceptable, um, but not an office in itself in, uh, for use of the entirety of the building. Councillor Baker. Uh, thank you. Another question. Uh, during the course of your remarks, uh, you said that uh, the city does not support commercial uses in indu on industrial land, correct? Uh, that term, commercial uses, is that defined in the town planning scheme or is that just a... a, a it is. And, uh, okay, because you'd think all industrial land, if it's occupied and improved, with, uh, assuming they're not operated by NGOs, that every use of every such block of land would be for a commercial use. But what, what is that definition? Just to assist me, I could flick through the scheme. I don't have it with me. It's a lengthy document. I've tried to access it via my laptop, but I can't get it. Um, so I, ha I don't have a copy of my scheme to hand, but essentially commercial uses are uses that you would typically find in activity centres or in business locations. That's distinct from industrial areas, such as Wangara, which is primarily industrial, where you would expect... Um, manufacturing type uses, um, showroom type right. activities, which are, are distinct from um, what we would want to encourage and support in commercial or business Thank and you. land. Councillor Baker. But, but see, that, that's the point. What I'm saying was that surely uh, those uses you've described are commercial in nature. They're not being the, the use of the land isn't being oper uh, operated, to, or the use is not being, if you like, conducted by an, a, a non government organisation. They are commercial businesses. They are there. Their objective is to obviously make profits, of course, as, as you'd appreciate. So that's what I'm saying. Where is the fine line between commercial uh, and non-commercial? Uh, is it simply whether it's a profit-making entity or whether it's a, 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 a non-government organisation? How do you define that term commercial, please? So, so both are employment type uses. Um, so there's, in, in our scheme, there is a commercial zone and obviously a service industrial zone. There, there are different objectives depending on um, the zone, and there are also different land use permissibilities. So the scheme sets out what the intent behind the objectives of each of those are, which are quite distinct and deliberate in order to enable certain businesses to operate and thrive in different locations. Now, noting in Wangara, there are some business zoned land within Wangara as well as service industrial. So there is, there is land within this area where offices would be permissible and encouraged to support the service industrial land uses within, within the, the um, primary industrial area. Thank you. Councillor Rowe. Uh, thanks, Deputy Mayor. I just have two questions, if that's OK. Uh, page 26 of the report acknowledged the presence of some remnant offices in the area. I just wondered if administration was able to uh, speculate as to how widespread this might be, because the term remnant uh, just is a bit broad. Um, through you, um, Deputy Mayor, um, so administration hasn't done a detailed survey or audit of the uh, Wangara industrial area, uh, but it is acknowledged, I think, in the report that there are some um, existing offices, um, and we, without doing an audit, I think a lot of those offices may have existed prior to 2001. So for council members' benefit, 
in prior to 2001, um, town planning scheme number one was in place, and that allowed offices within this area to be permitted, subject to getting an approval. Uh, since 2001, when um, district planning scheme number two was gazetted, office use was prohibited. It was an ex-use. And that might explain why there are some offices that exist within the Wangara industrial area. Just one minute, Councillor Baker. Councillor Rowe, you had another question. Uh, thanks, Deputy Mayor. Uh, just the second question. Um, I don't believe the officer's recommendation is to enforce compliance retrospectively on any other strata owners who, haven't, who have installed offices without approval. I just wanted to ask administration, could you foresee a situation where tenants feel less inclined to follow the proper process if they see others who have that office use are not, um, compliance is not being enforced upon them? Um, I could foresee a situation through you, Deputy Mayor, where there could lead to a proliferation of other um, uh, proponents um, simply choosing to create an office within an area that isn't identified for that use. I, I would also point out that in accordance with your compliance policy, where administration is made aware of a non-compliant building or use, um, we will take action to regularise that. Now, but we don't proactively go out and seek unauthorised uses. Um, however, where it is brought to our attention from uh, the local community or elected members, we will take action in accordance with your compliance policy. Thank you. Councillor Miles, you had a question? Thank, thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor. Um, my question on this one is obviously, uh, that particular building, uh, I think most people are very much aware of it. It was a real estate uh, company for many, many years, and I totally understand where administration's coming from. Um, with regard to if there's some other method of normalising the site, I think using your words, you would, you're suggesting then that the council may look at normalising the whole uh, lot, all of the stratas, uh, and I don't know how many there are there. Um, it, could that be done uh, using this person's uh, application? Uh, yes, yes, it could. Um, and I think, uh, as I pointed out in, in my introduction to the report, that if council is mindful to support the scheme amendment, my recommendation to you would be that that amendment apply to the parent lot, which includes all 11 of the strata lots within that. That would have the benefit then of um, helping to regularise the other office uses that exist on some of the other strata lots um, and make them potentially being um, approved subject to a future development application. Councillor Savitton. Sorry, Councillor Miles, was that your... Thank you, Councillor Savitton. Uh, yes, thank you, um, uh, Deputy Mayor. Um, Mark, uh, previous to 1999, that, that area, well, I'm not too, too sure when, how far back it went, but it was zoned composite business slide industrial. And under that zone, the David Evans uh, establishment, I think, was formed where they could operate under that particular zone. Now, they've been there since virtually up until probably, I don't know, six months, maybe 12 months ago, uh, in which uh, I believe David Evans retired. But... Um, Based on that particular zone, um, the question was asked previously whether there are any remnant businesses that were operating as a office space, although in parts of, of that area of Wangara, there are some business zones which were created some 10 years ago or so. So my worry is that um, uh, I would like to see some of these um, offices continue but under the proposed new planning scheme that the city may be looking at in the next few years, is it your intention to tidy up these and, and, and get away from discretionary and also um, 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 additional type uses to modify them into these areas? Because um, when someone wants to actually start up a business, they want to be in the area that it will service their business the best. So. Um, on that, will you be looking at the new town planning schemes to modify that 
and somehow bring them into the context of, say, Wangara and possibly uh, some of the other industrial areas. Um, thank you. And, and through you, um, Chair, the, um, that's a good question. Um, as elected members will be aware, amendment number 172 to district planning scheme is currently out for consultation. What that is proposing for this service industrial zone is that it changes to a light industrial zone. It's currently an ex, offices are currently an ex-use in the service industrial zone and are proposed to remain as an ex-use in the proposed um, zone that will be changed as part of Amendment 172. As I alluded to in my introduction, if council members are mindful to want to support small-scale offices within the Wangara industrial estate, a strategic approach to doing so would be through that Amendment 172, thereby enabling some other offices to be potentially located within the light industrial area. Having said that, and as I alluded to, then if you do start to change the land use permissibility in the zone, it potentially changes the character of that area, and it potentially fetters the opportunity for service industrial type land uses to be provided within the city. In my view, as your director of planning, there are sufficient areas within the city where offices are intended to be located to support the vibrancy and vitality of your town centres and commercial and business locations. If you start to broaden the areas where offices could be located, you potentially undermine that viability and you potentially restrict the opportunity for industrial type uses to be located. That's my primary concern. My primary concern isn't in relation to this particular amendment, it's the broader commutative impact of changing the scheme and supporting these types of uses. Yes, thank you, uh, Deputy Chair. Um, the reason I ask that question is that I'm increasingly seeing the area of Wangara changing in its dynamics and uh, not just um, offices and other type uses, it's the way that people, or the way that factories are actually being organised now. And under our, under our scheme, we have um, um, constraints on parking, landscaping, uh, and such. Operators are now using their car parking areas. Um, I know I'm uh, diluting away from this particular thing, but it's important that I make this point, because I intend to bring that up sometime in the future. And that is that, um, Everywhere you go in, in Enterprise Park, etc., all the streets are now filled with cars. Where normally... Ca councillors... Yes, getting, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm getting to the point now. Getting to the question, yep. thank you. And, uh, and, and my point is that if this particular block was um, agreed to as an additional use office, um, will there be enough car parking bays um, as... Uh, uh, was proposed way back in 1996 to accommodate enough people within that complex. Yes. That councillor right, yes, so we, we eventually got through to you. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, I just wanted to flag for members of the public and council that I will be bringing an alternative motion um, to the next ordinary council meeting. Thank you. Councillor Baker, you had your hand up earlier on. Councillor Parker. Parker. I've spoken tonight. Yes, you can take priority, please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if there is an amendment to consider office a discretionary use under DPS2, would that only apply to existing offices and not new builds? Um, thank, thank you. It would apply to both. So it would apply to existing buildings, but also potential new and emerging um, developments. Councillor Baker. Uh, thanks, Mr. Acting Chair. Just a question back to Mark. Uh, perhaps a, an observation or comment and then a question. I think you'd agree, without putting a too cynical note on it, that uh, Enterprise Park uh, is seen as being the more desirable location, subject to where the business's uh, client base is positioned. If it's at Midland, for example, you have a better road network to get uh, from Enterprise Park than from Wangara. Enterprise Park is a new trendy kid on the block. It's modern, etc. neat, tidy. It doesn't look old, tired. But in any event, my question relates to this issue of non-conforming uses. For example, in any given uh, uh, building within 
uh, within uh, that particular area. How do you know that the building has not previously been used for office use prior to the change in the law, and as such, even though it's a non-conforming use now to use as an office, nonetheless it was a valid pre-existing non-conforming use, which continued in time notwithstanding the change in the planning of uh, the zones within that area of Wangara. How, how do you know that? You don't have a record of all the offices that were operating prior to the change of the permitted uses within that area within Wangara, correct? So, um, in answer to that to that question, um, there may be instances uh, pre two thousand and one uh, where offices were an allowable use, and they got a development approval to use it as an office. That's fine. There may be also be instances pre two thousand and one where they got um, offices were permissible, but they constructed a building but not for an office use. Uh, they may have constructed it for um, manufacturing, industrial use, uh, showrooms, but didn't get development approval for office use, but subsequently used it for office purposes. Now, in those instances, there are no non-conforming use rights. They should have obtained a development approval at the time when they started to use it for office purposes, ideally pre-2001. If they didn't, there's no non-conforming continuous use rights. Supplementary? Councillor Baker. Yes, and if they did in fact obtain that planning consent, then that planning consent attaches to the land, not to the owner of the land. So it inures in for all successes, to all successes and title, correct? This is what I'm saying. So let's just say hypothetically in a particular area, a, 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 a unit, a strata title unit, was used as an office in, say, I don't know, 1989, OK? Uh, and I don't know what the scheme said in those days, whether you actually had to apply for a DA uh, and whether you had an as of right, right to use it without the need, need for a formal application for approval, even though it was permitted use. But once again, uh, in that scenario, who bears the onus of proof? If the city received a complaint about, for example, that office being used today, would, this, would the onus of proof be on the city to prove that it was not a, uh, a, that it was not a conforming use, even under the previous town planning scheme, in other words, that it was not a valid subsisting non-conforming use, or is the onus on the current owner of the property to prove that? And also in circumstances where, in many cases, the owner leases the premises to a lessee, the lease contains a provision to the effect that the lessor does not make any warranties regarding the, uh, whether or not the premises can be used for the, for the lessee's intended future use. Uh, how would you tar who would you know how to target? Would you target the, the, the landlord, the lessor, or the lessee, would you, or would you target both? Because they are both, I suppose, the landlord is perhaps complicit in the unlawful, alleged unlawful use. Who bears the onus of proof? The, the onus of proof would always lie with the owner of the property to demonstrate um, an, any relevant information to the satisfaction of the city. I, w I would reiterate that if um, a landowner obtained an approval for an office pre-2001 in accordance with the scheme at that time, then that's fine. That runs with the, the land, the building, and not if there's a change of owner. So that would be fine in that instance. And there are, I am sure, many examples of that that currently exist within the area. Final one, sir. This is very important. If I can, please. Thank you. Councillor Baker. Thank you. Does the city have a record going back that far? I'm aware of one case involving myself where I purchased a licensed lodging house on the basis it was a licensed lodging house. Uh, it, the owner had previously been paying rates since 1972. The lodging house was signposted from uh, uh, Yancha Beach Road. Uh, it was advertised by the city in its tourism brochures since 1975. Uh, it was opened by Alan Bond. Uh, and when we purchased the property, the, the city said we could not use it as a licensed lodging house because it was a licensed lodging, allegedly a lodging house in a residential zone. And we said, this is licensed as a lodging house. It's, it's a pre-existing non-conforming use relative to the, the time that uh, the scheme was changed. And uh, in short, the city, the city could not find any records of, uh, of having issued a lodging house license, even though we, had to, we, we and the previous owners had to renew it annually and were subject to annual health checks, et cetera, et cetera, the kitchen, bathrooms, kitchen, commercial kitchens, driveway. Uh, what I'm saying to you is, does the city actually have records going back to, for example, 1986 or 1989? I assume that they would be manual re paper records, not electronic records, because from, I can see that, uh, once again, if the third option that you've suggested is, is endorsed by the city, that's my view, we should endorse that, uh, that uh, this will be an issue in itself. You know, what particular premises require a new, a new planning consent or DA to uh, permit them to carry on 
the business of the operating an office place. So I think there were several questions in there. Um, with regard to the broad principle, we've, we've got records that go back. Obviously, the records are what are available, and they go back to the pre-split between the city of Wanneroo and the city of Joondalup. So if we have information, we will be able to retrieve that information from the system. Um, I, I think you're talking about a point of principle, so it really is for the uh, proponent, the applicant, the owner, to provide sufficient information to demonstrate non-conforming use rights, um, and that's for you to provide that information or whoever, depending on the circumstance. I'm presuming you're not talking about Wangara here, there's a separate and distinct site. Yeah, as a general point, it, it would be for the proponent to demonstrate information to the city's satisfaction that there is a non-conforming right. Uh, Councillor Nguyen? I like the third option that you mentioned earlier. Just in relation to the proposed um, uh, amendment number 172 to the um, district planning scheme number two, um, if we were to add office uh, as a permitted use as part of the scheme, uh, would there be a need for re-advertising for public consultation? And what is the time frame um, for it to go back to council? Um, yeah, that's a good question. It depends on the nature of what the scale of what you're proposing as to whether re-advertising would be required. It may be that the city receives submissions during the advertising period to do exactly what you're proposing to, and that gives the city on the council the head of power to then continue with that with that amendment. If it's a major change to what was advertised, it may be prudent for council to re-advertise the intent. Um, it, it really, and it also partly I think depends on the nature and scale of, you know, if, if you're proposing small scale offices to be accommodated, not large scale offices, then that's something that you could make an argument is a very minor in nature. That's something we'd certainly discuss with council as part of amendment 172, as part of the preparation of the local planning strategy, which council members are aware that we're preparing at the moment, and also within the provisions of your new scheme three, which hopefully um, should be coming to council within the next 12 months. Are there any further questions on this item, councillors? Councillor Miles. Thank you. Just a, 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 I will be a quick question, but I don't know how long the answer will be. Um, my question uh, relates to, um, I guess the question is, and I'm not sure whether Mr Marmion's team need to be involved in this as well, but there's very clear um, indication that businesses are moving into Wangara to do offices, retail, uh, and all the less rest of it. So th there obviously has to be a reason for that. And I know you've indicated that there are other areas that are zoned to take uh, office and, and, and other use. Um, is it because that other, those other buildings or that other land is too spread out and people want to be in a concentrated area? Um, so I'd like to understand from administration's point of view, or, or maybe we can get economic team to say, it's happening because of this reason. So we can then obviously plan for that going forward. Um, I'm certainly happy to liaise with Mr Marmion to try and find if there's any underlying trends as to what's causing that. I, I would point out that one of the key triggers is, is likely that industrial land is cheaper to either acquire or lease or rent than commercial or business land. Um, that's a fact. Um, and that may be a part reason why some um, applicants are choosing to try and locate within these areas. Um, but I'm not an expert in this field, um, and I certainly don't know why, why businesses are choosing to take a certain course of action. But I would be happy to liaise with Mr Marmion and provide further information on that to council members. Thank you, Mr Dixon. Any further questions, councillors, on this item? Thank you. We'll probably move on to item 4.4 now with Mr Bowering. And just before we go forward, Councillor Savitton, did you want to just a short declaration coming up next week? Yes, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, yes, look, I would like to um, 
make a declaration with regard to item 4.4. I disclose that um, I am a member of the Joint Development Assessment Panel. Um, and uh, as a con con consequence, there may be a perception that my impartiality on this matter may be affected. I declare that I will consider this matter on its merits and vote accordingly. Thank yeah, you. Not that we need the voting part tonight, but thank you. Councillor Newan. Um, yes, for the same reasons, I am also a member of the Joint Development, um, the JDAP, um, and I will consider this uh, matter on its merits and will vote accordingly. Thank you. Mr. Barring. Uh, thank you. Uh, through Councillor, you. sorry, Councillor Miles. Uh, th thank you, Deputy Mayor. I will also make the declaration of impartiality for the same item, as I am a delegate to um, to the JDAP. However, I'm not uh, trained to actually sit on the panel as yet, so I figured that I better just make the declaration and disclose that uh, I am a deputy delegate or reserve delegate. If somebody drops off, then I go on. So. Uh, I'll make the full declaration next week. Just making sure we get the interchange rules there, right, so Councillor yeah, Miles? Yeah, Excellent. Right, uh, Councillor Huntley. Yes. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Yes, I actually need to make the same declaration, and I am trained, but I am a deputy, so I actually don't, at the moment, uh, the two serving members uh, fulfil the uh, objects of the data. So again, I disclose that as a consequence, there may be a perception of my impartiality, but um, we'll be dealing with that next week. Thanks. Coming in as a medical sub, marvellous. Thank you, Councillor Huntley. Mr Bowring, I think we're right to go. Thank, thank you, through you, Deputy Mayor, uh, Councillor Treaty. Um, Item 4.4 on tonight's agenda is for Council to consider the matter of urgent business presented to the 15th of March Ordinary Council meeting by Councillor Baker in relation to the Metro Outer Joint Development Assessment Panel application for a shop, liquor store and office development at number 10 Enterprise Avenue, Two Rocks. The JDAP application will be determined by the Metro Outer JDAP and not the um, City of Wanneroo or the Council of Wanneroo when it again meets to consider the proposal in several weeks' time. The JDAP deferred making a decision on the proposal at its meeting on 9th of March 2022 for up to eight weeks to seek further comment from the Department of Planning, Lands and Heritage in relation to local and state heritage considerations. The DPLH um, department has, as of yesterday, provided its response to the city's request made on behalf of the JDAP. That response has now been circulated to councillors and members of the community and will be attached to the report on the matter to be presented at next week's council meeting. That advice in summary largely confirms the previous advice of the DPLH that's contained in the RAR that the site is not on the state register and as such the department cannot make any comments on the proposal. Councillors will be aware that the proposed development is within the former Marine Park Atlantis and is adjacent to the King Neptune statue. The former area of the Marine Park is listed in the city's local heritage survey as category four, little significance, which means a uh, contributes to the understanding of the history of the city of Wanneroo, photographically recorded prior to major development or demolition. Recognise and interpret the site if possible. While the King Neptune statue is listed as category two, considerable significance. Considerable significance is very important to the heritage of the locality, high degree of integrity and authenticity, conservation of the place is highly desirable. Any alterations or extensions should, extensions should reinforce the significance of the place. The city's local heritage survey was last reviewed by council in 2016 and is, and is currently undergoing a further review by administration. The site or the, uh, or the the site or the statue are not listed on the State Register of Heritage Places. However, as per the advice from the DPLH, the Heritage Council in 2003 considered that the Sun City Precinct should be assessed for possible entry onto the State Register. However, no action by the Heritage Council has been taken to progress that matter since that time. The King Neptune statue sits to the north of the subject site across the newly constructed Azura Street. As part of the subdivision of the land by Finney Group, the statue has been located within a one hectare POS site 
that runs along the north side of Azura Street from Lisford Avenue on the east to Enterprise Avenue on the west. The land to the north of that site is now, uh, now owned by the Royal Australian Air Forces Association who are planning to develop that land. The Two Rocks Town Centre structure plan was approved by the WAPC in, in August 2014 and forms the key planning framework for the assessment of the application and administration's recommendation to the JDAP for conditional approval. In this regard, the recommended conditions of approval, numbers five, seven and eight in the agenda on page 100 uh, to the JDAP are intended to provide the opportunity for the city to work with the developer and landowner to integrate heritage elements into the final built outcome, such as through placement of reclaimed statues from the former marine park to create a heritage trail, the use of colours, textures and materials that are more sympathetic to the location and history of the area, and other elements that can be incorporated into the building to bring to life the history and significance of the location, such as plaques, written information and imagery. The city has also recently received information from the land developer outlining their plans for integration of heritage elements in the future development of the broader area, uh, which will be included within the uh, report to count, uh, next week's council meeting. Uh, administration will resubmit the RAR to the JDAP and uh, the, as an addendum, the DPLH advice, which we received yesterday, and, and uh, council's resolution on the matter next week. Um, the deputations on the matter have dealt with a range of detail about the proposed form of development, and much of this is responded to or addressed in the RAR. I'm happy to take any questions. Well, Councillor Curtsy. Thank you. Um, to move a little bit away from the heritage problem that um, is a big problem in everybody's mind at the moment, I had a lot of meetings and discussions with the Two Rocks residents. And the feeling I got from them was they wanted that area to have a touristy feel. And with the design that is currently on the RAR, um, with the, with the big parking area right on, on top of that busy road, and then with the big building, with a big roof as well, and with Neptune looking on top of the roof or over the roof, yes, there might be a coffee shop right next to that new road going through, um, but then again, that road might also get very busy, and I think it is going to get really busy, and it doesn't feel very touristy. My question is, when the design was put forward to administration, administration obviously made a study of it. Did administration see the same, what I am just said now? Uh, did administration ask the developer to maybe re-look at it, redesign it? Um, or could administration send it back to redesign it? Or did administration? Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, the administration did go through a process of assessment with the applicant um, and through uh, se several iterations of the plans. Uh, initially, uh, the city's design review panel made significant comments and adjustments were made based on that advice from the, the design review panel. Um, and then further changes that were made through, uh, through further assessment at, uh, by administration to refocus the building more towards the Azura Street and form up more of a Main Street built form. And also, um, we did raise the issue of colours and materials and uh, the heritage fabric um, through that um, negotiation and discussion of the, uh, through the assessment process. And uh, because of the timeframes that we have to work with in the JDAP system, uh, having limited time or specified time to resolve applications, uh, the uh, approach to recommend conditions of approval to address as some of those elements uh, was used. Councillor Wright. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, I've got two questions in relation to this issue, um, and they're both to administration. Um, so the first one is, um, I understand that this issue is obviously uh, part of the JDAP and obviously we have an obligation to provide a city report. Um, 
So my question is, why didn't it come to council um, in terms of council deals with issues that are of significant importance to the community? And, and I'm not talking about the actual item, I'm talking about the authority report that council did not have a say in terms of formulating our, our consultation in terms of a wider community, because we are the representatives of council, um, and particularly that we deal as our role is matters of interest to the community. And obviously this sparked a lot of interest of the community. Um, and my second question is, um, why is the recommendation contradictory to the issue? And the issue on page 96 says, to allow council to consider the proposal and resolve whether to provide a recommendation or amendment to the recommendation contained within the report. Yeah, the recommendation for both of them is only noting. It doesn't actually provide any recommendation for council to alter, modify or change that report. So. Uh, could you please clarify that? Uh, thank you, uh, through you, Mr. Uh, Deputy Mayor. The process of the JDAP is to, or for the local authority, the administration of the local authority, to provide a recommendation to the JDAP, which sits in place of council to make determinations. So under the JDAP regulations, there's two council members and three appointed specialist members. They take on the role. So when under the regulations, the organisation is to prepare a report and submit that in the same way as we submit a report normally to council for a determination. So the process that Wanneroo has is to receive the uh, JDAP applications. In this case, they can either be a, a, a voluntary uh, JDAP application if they're over $2 million in value or a mandatory if they're over $10 million in value. And once we have received that, we go through the uh, formal notification and advertising processes and prepare our report as though we were preparing a report to council. So our, um, since the JDAPs were introduced into Western Australia, uh, that has been the process for Wanneroo to uh, deal with JDAP applications. Councillor Greg, was, the, was that covering both sections of the, uh, sorry, just before Councillor Baker, did that cover both questions from Councillor Wright? Yeah, yes, the, sorry, the recommendation is a administrative recommendation to the decision maker, in this case, the JADA. So the recommendation is um, drawn from the provisions of the scheme, the relevant policies adopted by council. So that planning framework that council um, adopts and in, endorses through the, the scheme and its uh, local planning policies and structure plans. So in, in, I think what Councillor Wright was alluding to is why is the recommendation just to note and not put forward a recommendation to council? So. When this matter was requested from Councillor Baker to be um, presented as an urgent item of business, the, re the recommendation was that we present the responsible authority report. Administration's recommendation is contained within the responsible authority report. Now, it will be for Council at next week's Council meeting to determine what it wants to, uh, what its views are, what its recommendation will be to uh, the JDAP. Uh, when you consider that matter next week. Okay. Councillor Baker. Uh, thank you. Uh, sir, uh, Mr Chair, if I could just make a comment just to perhaps uh, expedite uh, the, the issues that will arise shortly in terms of what's going on. Uh, in short, if I can, please, with your indulgence, please, Mr Chair. Ooh, perhaps yeah. I'll structure as a question. Mr Dixon, Director of Planning, isn't it the case that at the next, at next week's Council meeting that I, Councillor Baker, will move a motion uh, the gist of which will be to uh, incorporate a new amendment to the proposed recommendation by inserting a paragraph three, which will state in short that the city does not support the, well, the subject Woolworths DA for reasons relating to various principles involving the planning policies and fundamental planning principles, and that uh, JDAP be informed of this decision. Is that the case, that that is the amendment, that the gist of the amendment that you are presently working on and preparing, or assisting me with the preparation of a report? in think, support of that amendment? Is that the case? I think That's what, a question. Count, Thank you. what Councillor Baker is alluding to is foreshadowing um, an amendment to the recommendation that administration has prepared, which we will assist Councillor Baker in preparing, um, and that is what administration is intending to do. Thank you, Mr Dixon. Yeah, thank you, uh, uh, 
Deputy Mayor. Um, uh, I just wanted to ask a couple of questions um, to Mr Bowering. In the report, um, obviously, the, the, everybody's obviously focusing on the fact that uh, there's a building application to put a small shopping centre in place and other ancillary items. But the actual site was zoned uh, for this very use. Um, when was that first uh, advertised and when would have the, some of the consultation have been done to rezone the land to allow it to become a future shopping centre? Um, in the early, two th in the, well, the mid, mid to late 2000s, um, the council endorsed the local planning strategy f over the area in 2010 and it was subsequently approved by the Planning Commission and the Minister uh, in 2014. So there was, in that time period, um, a range of uh, considerations and advertising consultation processes carried out. Are, are you aware of... I mean, I, I'm obviously, I wasn't here at the time and you probably wasn't either, um, but was there... There would have been some level of consultation, there would have been a board put up or some sort of community consultation. Are you aware whether there was any... Um, any submissions when that proposal first went out? Um, I'm, I'm aware that the uh, proponent, the landowner, undertook the, uh, consultation as part of preparing the local planning strategy or the, um, the structure plan, and that there was consultation with uh, various residents through Two Rocks at the time. Um, I'd have to take it on notice as to what was the extent of consultation that the city undertook um, in relation to the structure plan. So was the structure plan for the whole, I guess, of the what we would deem as the, the Finney site, which is including the old shopping centre? Because I also am aware that there is also some proposal to put some uh, apartments and housing uh, within this area as well. So all that would have happened with that... Did you say it was a district scheme or what, what was the actual term back then? Uh, thank you. It was a local structure plan at the time. Um, so, yes, the range of uses talks about apartments and townhouses, uh, retail, um, a range of activities to support that uh, commercial and mixed sort of use environment around the uh, Harp Marina. So also as part of that, then, clearly the landowner would be looking at possibly even rebuilding a good part of the old centre being its age. Um, so uh, obviously the, the, the zoning that he requested back then would have obviously incorporated changing that whole site. Um, um, I guess what I'm getting at, I'm trying to establish whether there was appropriate level of consultation back then. Uh, now I know people move, um, but land zoning is done for a reason. Um, so, uh, and also the other interesting thing I note up there at the moment, they are still putting in some road accesses and linkages in, so they are rolling along and getting those sites prepared for the future apartments and so forth and restaurants to what I see on the plans. Uh, thank you. Yes, that's correct. The um, West Australian Planning Commission is... Um, approving subdivisions which create the lots and the road reserves and that's in accordance with the structure plan which delineates sort of the general road layout. Um, so that is essentially the approved planning framework for subdivision which is a form of development and then subsequently we receive applications for building and construction. Um, now in the RAR that we've received uh, tonight, uh, you've indicated in there that the proponent has still yet to uh, put in the uh, application or presented to administration uh, the application for the colour scheme of the centre. Uh, the residents tonight spoke of uh, it's going to be a grey Woolworths block. Um, so the colour schemes for the centre are, are still yet to be defined by administration, is that right? Uh Thank you. It, certainly it's a matter of that we've sought to impose a condition in relation to through the uh, Responsible Authority Report recommendation so that there's further work done with the city to develop that further. Obviously the applicant has presented a colour palette and materials that they wish to use. 
We've raised that uh, through our assessment that we're not satisfied with that and that we would like to see um, more work with us through that condition of approval. And the, a question that was raised by uh, Councillor uh, Baker earlier, which I did think had some merit, um, if, if King Neptune is going to be, um, obviously it is a lookout, it is, people walk up there and they use it as a lookout, um, if the rooftop is going to be visually seen from that site, um, is it not possible to make sure that that rooftop is uh, not obstructed by exhaust fans and the like, and can they be placed in a more appropriate level, um, which I know some of the City of Perth buildings are also trying to do similar things to, to make looking out of, you know, offices and apartments, people aren't looking down on ugly uh, air conditioning units. So is that something that can be tackled as part of the design uh, going forward? Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, um, if you recall, during the deputation, Mr Kelly mentioned that the plant and machinery generally will be accommodated within the built form uh, below the, the roof line so that um, you wouldn't see most of that. Um, but obviously, if there's a fit out within the building that needs um, a roof um, perforation for extraction fans or the like, then that might not be avoidable. But certainly, um, it, the design, and that's certainly something that our design review panel asks about. And they ask about the location of condensers and equipment and plant when they're looking at these sorts of developments to make sure that they do have a tidy roof and that they are uh, visually attractive from most angles. Uh, the other part of talking about the design, um, and I know that, uh, and I'm not sure whether we do it here, but I know that the City of Perth are attempting to get some of these buildings um, with even if it was fake grass on the roof. Um, is that something that City has ever asked? In this situation, we've got a very unique uh, lookout um, that we could obviously ask for something better than just uh, a white colour bond roof. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm familiar with the issue and the CBD and the, the appearance of roofs and as, as a matter of dealt with in another local authority, um, it's not something that is typically um, pressured City of Wanneroo in terms of our decision making. It's um, not, uh, I guess, known for its um, large tall buildings at the moment, but that will change over time as we develop our town centres. So. Um, it is something that we're aware of when we're going through the design review panel process and it's in feedback that we look for when we're um, uh, dealing with applicants at the early stage. Um, also, um, like all the other councillors, I've received uh, a letter from Mr Bauer, uh, Mr Bauer, Michael Bauer, who's, I think, uh, part of the, uh, I think, Finney group. Um, on, on page three of that, it indicates that the where King Neptune is and other areas along uh, Azalea, Azalea Road, I think it's called, uh, has already been ceded over to the Crown and could possibly be under the management of the city already. Is, is that fact? Uh, yes, the property is a one hectare parcel which is consistent with sort of the modified structure plan which shows that um, being a a one hectare POS that was a redesign from the original structure plan, which had a 5,000 square metre site around the King Neptune statue and a separate POS site further to the north centrally in that um, street block. So the, um, the site is subject of an agreement um, because of the subdivision process. Uh, the POS hasn't been developed at this stage. The city holds a bond of about $400,000 surety with RAFA to make sure that they do develop the POS to our satisfaction. Uh, so it is in our management at this stage. So the, the, the site is under our management at this stage or is yeah, it under yeah, the control of the state? Uh, it's a Crown Reserve um, and it's a, a management order to the city is my understanding, although I will double check that and make sure. Um, but the developer is um, obligated to complete the POS development works, which would ordinarily have been done before the roads, but bonding is a fairly common approach at the moment. And uh, just with that, I note uh, that it is quite a large uh, public open space, and I think that would look relatively good. 
Uh, but also in Mr Bower's letter, he's indicated, and, I, and I'm not sure whether you can put these into next week's, uh, this letter into next week's report, so it's public. Um, he's obviously indicated, you know, the pathways and trees and, and the like, which obviously are indicative at this stage. Um, but he does talk in the letter that uh, it, it could be an opportunity for the uh, celebrity sun clock to be reinstalled in that park. Uh, is that something that the uh, administration through community in place have been looking at at all? I know that our land development team have been uh, looking at the development of that site and the POS site. Um, the, the current owners, Rafa, have some issues with the design and the distribution of POS and they're looking at that site in more detail. Um, because there's some yeah, legacy issues with drainage and uh, uh, w surface water management in the area um, that may affect the distribution of POS. So, so just in answer to your question, I, I, you asked about specifically about the clock. I'm not aware of any conversations that have been had either by the Planning and Sustainability Director or community in place with regard to that. That's not to say that that couldn't be something that administration would consider um, if and when that's formally proposed to the city. I, I only make that suggestion because I know that uh, Community in Place Director Ms Terrellink has spoke about the Duplusi uh, statues before in this place um, and it would be nice to uh, utilise those in the same format that was originally intended, uh, maybe less some of the characters that were on the original clock, maybe some more modern uh, statues could be uh, created. Um, uh, just, just sort of finally on that. So, if if the rougher uh, obviously has to find a a, a drainage uh, swale, uh, as I say, we we don't want sumps. Um, it could then also maybe uh, be created within that area because a hectare of land is quite large, uh, or that for that whole strip. Um, it could also have another nod to the fact that there was a dolphin ponds there, pools there, uh, with some sort of dolphin statue within the swale. So. Uh, in the rain and the winter, you might then get some water in and around that, that particular statue. So um, I'm thinking that uh, it could be a very good, unique park, uh, giving a very good nod to the heritage of, of, that, of that site as a whole. Actually, just on that, Councillor, can you try and frame that into a question? Did you quite, is it possible for you to frame that into a question? So... Uh, <laughs> So, so is it possible then for uh, administration um, to incorporate all what I said within that public <laughs> open space? Um, th through you, Chair, yes. Um, obviously, this report is in relation to a Woolworths development application essentially on the other side of, of Azura. Um, so, but these are all issues that I think are of relevance in terms of future heritage of the town centre. And that's something we would, administration would work very closely with the proponent, whether that's Rafa, whether that's the Finney group, or whether that's Woolworths to ensure that the heritage and the context and the history of this area isn't forgotten. And that is planned for, and if there are sculptures, we would certainly work towards ensuring that they're provided and reinstated within the town centre. Remember, this is specifically about the development application at Woolworth, so there may be some opportunities within that context, but there certainly will be opportunities as the town centre is further developed in the future. Uh, I only bring that up, Mr Dixon. I, I totally appreciate uh, what you say there, but uh, Mr. Mr Bower sent us all a letter indicating all of that items. So he sort of introduced that as part of, I guess, his... Uh, idea for the area, including the current uh, centre? I think through you, Chair, that, that was simply to try and demonstrate that the intention is not to forget about the heritage, noting that it doesn't form part of the specific development application, but is in potentially impacted by the development application. Okay. Councillor Baker, I think I had you next. Oh, I've got a question, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my question is directed to Mark Dixon, Director of Planning. Mark, earlier on in your, uh, when you introduced this item, you said that the city's design panel, uh, sorry, there had been discussions between the applicant developer and the city's divide, uh, design panel uh, in the lead up to the DA being lodged, as far as I'm aware. Uh, 
Can you tell me who are the members of the design panel and how are they appointed to the panel and what skills or expertise, et cetera, did they bring to the panel? Please. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, the city's design review panel consists of eight members. Uh, they're primarily uh, qualified experienced architects that are selected by the city through a uh, advertised process. Um, and we uh, appoint them based on the merit of their application uh, through the director. And that um, they then are there to provide technical advice and feedback to applicants to help them refine and improve the quality of their applications, before, ideally before they submit. Uh, are you at liberty to disclose their names and... Uh, uh, I can provide you a list of the names and the... Well, it's and not confidential, I assume. No, it's not no, confidential no. at all. And also, are they paid a fee for the participation? They are paid a fee? C correct, yes. They're paid, but they're paid consultants assisting the city. I'd like to... Yeah, is, do they keep minutes of their meetings? Do they have minutes? Yeah, indeed, yes. Is it possible so they, to get copies of the... True yes, copies of they, the minutes of those meetings? Circulated. They can be yep. made available under yep, 5.194 of the Act. Thanks. Yep. Excellent. That's right. Uh, because I think uh, a lot of these issues that have been raised since the DA first hit the streets, so to speak, were, uh, could have been lined, uh, ironed out in that very early stage. But anyhow, so uh, Next, you said, uh, oh yes, Councillor Miles has referred to the letter from Mr Bowers that uh, was emailed to the city last week regarding the public open space, right? I think you, you call that, and I think you said, yes, that, that uh, email and glossy brochure will be made available to the elected members prior to next week's ordinary council meeting. I think you would agree that that brochure was basically intended to say this has nothing to do with the Woolworths development, but across the road, here's what we're thinking of. It seemed to be like some sort of a lever in the sales pitch, so to speak, to try and get this thing over the line of the city. But in that particular flyer, there's, uh, or I should say email, there was a, a concept plan to the public open space, that it was presented in the, in the plan uh, as all the, the, the concept drawing, if you like, colouring in, that uh, it would be one continuous public open space. My understanding is that Presently, that is not possible due to the issue that you raised, alluded, alluded to earlier, the issue of the drainage sump. So that, that, particular, uh, uh, that particular design for the singular public open space is, for want of a better term, incorrect. And in fact, it currently comprises, comprises of two separate and distinct pieces of public open space which would need to be linked, so to speak, for uh, what, that, uh, that, uh, what that glossy, so to speak, Represented by American, but Councillor Baker, just on that, it's a fair preamble. You have a question? Yes. <laughs> I was just, I was just getting, catching my breath. Just be with me. Where was I? I'm sorry, my short-term memory shot. Really, really. <laughs> I was up to the, the seventh paragraph of the preamble. That's right. In a nutshell, would you agree that that brochure, that glossy brochure, was not di uh, diagram grammatically correct? It was perhaps innocently, unwittingly misleading. And, uh, and that, uh, strictly speaking, that uh, email bore no relationship, so to speak, to uh, the DA across the road at the Woolworths site. Thanks. Uh, thank you. I can address most of those points, I believe. Uh, the um, site, uh, the POS site is currently a one hectare site. It, it does reflect the information or the, the concept that was drawn, I believe, in Mr Bower's letter to councillors. Uh, which we uh, again circulated to make sure everyone had received it. So at the moment, yes, it is a, site, a single site. It had previously been a concept of two separate sites in the original structure plan that uh, subsequently changed at around the time that Rafa became interested in the site. Um, and now that Rafa has the site there, again, looking at whether or not that public open space can be split to address um, drainage and other issues. And just one, one final one, I promise. Uh, earlier on, I think, Mark, you made reference to the uh, applicant developer paying a bond of $400,000. My understanding from talking to Mr Bowers is that isn't simply a bond. It's a financial contribution towards the cost of developing, enhancing, and et cetera, et cetera, the public open space, beautifying it with statues and ponds or a pond or grass, lawn, roof of the shop, et cetera, if necessary. Is that the case? Is it actually a bond or is it a monetary contribution? Is it sitting in a reserve account, gaining interest, of course? Uh, uh, thank you. No, it is a bond. Uh, the, the RAFA is responsible for developing the POS at their cost to a, uh, essentially a minimum standard. Um, the bond is a performance one because that was uh, part of the clearance process as a caveat and a deed registered over the land in favour of the city to ensure that performance is achieved. 
Uh, look, without any way breach of confidentiality, my understanding is that the developer has stated that it has made a, a financial contribution, which is currently being held by the city in a reserve account, a contribution towards the development, et cetera, enhancement, improvement, what have you, of the public open space, parkland. You're saying that's not the case. Unless there are two payments. One is the bond and the other is the figure I think I heard of was half a million dollars. Is that correct or incorrect? It's not sitting in the reserve account, sorry. I, I'm not aware of there being any other uh, arrangement. I, I believe it's the bond is the only matter. Councillor Sengali. Um, I just wanted to ask about the actual submissions that came back to this, um, to the JDAP advertising. Because one thing I did notice is uh, Two Rocks itself has a current population of 4,700 people, approximately. Is that right? According to Forecast ID, that's what it says. <laughs> um, I, I can, if you've yeah. looked at Forecast ID, that's the best available information yeah. that the city has. So just taking that population into perspective, for JDAP to have a submission put into them that contained a petition with 1,202 signatures on it, that's quite a large response to a development in a local area, isn't it? I, I'm not sure what, what the question there is. Um, well, certainly there was a petition that was lodged and um, I couldn't categorically verify um, whether all of those who signed the petition were from Two Rocks, but it is, I accept it's a significant yeah. number of residents. So I'll probably reframe it then. Out of all the JDA applications that you get, to have a petition response come back in a negative, that is a quarter of the population, that's quite a high figure to come back, isn't it? Has is that happened with other applications that you've had before, where a quarter of the local population has actually responded no? Um, yeah, we have had significant numbers of, on other applications, but I don't think to that to that extent. Um, I, I, obviously, there is a, a significant amount of community interest in this development application. That is undoubted, and I think. I, our role in, in presenting a responsible authority report is to absolutely consider all of those submissions and present those to um, the uh, JDAP for their consideration, noting that any submission that is made has to be made on valid planning grounds set against the planning framework that is in place. Um, if there is a significant number of submissions that are made, but they're not made on valid planning grounds, if it's invalid planning grounds, then it will be given little weight by the JDAP in its consideration. But absolutely couldn't disagree with your comment around the, the sheer number of interested parties in, in signing that petition. Yeah. Um, the reason I've brought up the petition is because the petition actually addressed concerns with the heritage. That was part of the petition, wasn't it? And we can provide further information on exactly what was contained yeah. within the petition, um, or we could read it through now if you wish. It's up to you. Well, I guess the part I'm struggling with is we had some deputations earlier which gave very little regard to the heritage site being of cultural significance to the local community. It, there didn't seem to be much regard to the actual Atlantis site, for example, and it was pretty much written off before it was even started. And I find that quite extraordinary, given that we've got a quarter of the population has responded so loudly about how important this site is to them. So I, I'm struggling to understand whether it's under planning grounds, any kind of ground, how we can disregard something like that. Uh, Councillor Sangali, I'm sure you could probably formulate a question out of that somewhere. How can we disregard that? Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Sangali. That's a, it's a very good point, it, and it's quite um, important consideration in dealing with a development application. And as the, um, Mr Dixon outlined, 
planning isn't isolated to just policy. It does have to take into consideration the comments and the views of the community on a proposal, uh, balanced against that planning framework. So this is why we do the consultation, why there is uh, 100 or so pages of summaries of submissions that are included in the report and responded to each point in detail so that um, the decision maker has that in front of them, that they can see the volume of, of concern that's raised. We will make a report and a recommendation on that planning framework, primarily note, noting that the decision maker has the opportunity to look at that and balance that um, planning framework and recommendation against those considerations. Uh, submissions. I think, and, and just with regard to heritage, a significant amount of information has been provided around heritage. Um, obviously, it's a, a significant concern for the local residents. It's been assessed against the city's local heritage survey. Obviously, there's, it's been requested as part of the state heritage list, but hasn't that work hasn't been undertaken, and that was the reason for deferral. So. Um, a significant amount of information, the available information has been recorded in the responsible authority re report regarding heritage and regarding the potential impact of this development on the King Neptune statue in particular. Councillor Sangali. Um, I guess my other question as well, and it was the reason why I asked about the car park level versus King Neptune's ground level as well, is the city has regularly promoted the Yanship Two Rocks area as a tourism location, and we talk about tourism whenever we refer to Yanship and Two Rocks. Now, one of the most iconic photos that you can get of Two Rocks is of your overseas visitors standing on the palm of Neptune's hand. And the question I have now is how do we capture that photo without a drone are we expecting people to stand in the middle of the road to be able to stand back far enough to get that photo? Because they won't be able to get it from the car park because the level, the land level is so different now that all you're going to see is the back of his hand. So how are we going to capture, you know, we talk about tourism value and there's nothing more valuable for a local area than an Instagram photo that goes all over the world. And how do we get that now without a drone? Uh, thank you. Yeah, certainly that's a, a, a part of the, uh, the purpose and the importance of the site to the community and to visitors and tourism and to the city generally. So the framework that's in place is obviously there to support a redevelopment of the area surrounding the statue. That process identified the importance of the statue to the public and, and designed a plan to protect it and retain it in public ownership. So previously, privately owned, Category 2, um, Category two. Category 2 in the um, city's local heritage survey doesn't demand or require that a site be retained. Um, and so that process, that planning process engaged by the uh, developer and the landowner and the city resulted in a plan to retain and keep that statue in the public ownership for the long term. So that is part of the process of working out what is suitable development in terms of uh, commercial, res residential, retail uses that will um, be needed in that location to support the growing population over time. Councillor, yep, Councillor Nguyen. Thank you. Um, well, once a site has been identified by the Heritage Council, as um, warranting um, assessment for possible inclusion on the state register, how likely is it to be included in the state register? Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, I, we can't answer that question. The expert um, that was engaged by the developer who spoke earlier at the deputations um, made some fairly informed comments about that. Um, but I can't add to that, sorry. Yes, and, and that expert, I think Mr. Phil Grifford, um, answered my question in relation to the value or the heritage value of the site, and his response was there is no heritage value now and after the development. What's your response to that? 
uh, my understanding was he was referring specifically to the site of the Woolworths development, which has now been cleared of um, and prepared for subdivision, so that its value now as a heritage site is nil. Um, on our um, assessment of the Atlantis Marin Park, um, we assessed that um, some time ago with little um, as category four, little significance. Is that still the case? Um, and when was the last time we actually done a, an assessment of that? Uh, thank you. Yeah, as I mentioned earlier, the um, last review of the local heritage strategy was um, done in 2016, and we're currently performing the uh, regular review of that at the moment uh, by administration. So can you clarify when will you, when do you think you complete that review? Is it, will that be before the next JDAP meeting? Uh, no, that won't be in any, uh, that soon um, at this time. No, it won't be before that date. Uh, and generally, does uh, heritage value change over time? Uh, short answer is yes, um, it can, and depends on how the fabric survives over time as well, and how its authenticity and whether it's modified or how it's managed has a bit to do with that. Uh, sites can degrade, so that's why you have different degrees of protection in the Heritage Act, and uh, through the um, various uh, state, uh, local, state, and national um, registers of significance. I'm trying to reconcile the, the assessment that we place on uh, this um, Atlantis Marine Park as little significance to the community assessment that it's quite significant. So how do you recon reconcile those two views? Uh, thank you. So. When we're talking about the listing of the property under the heritage survey, that is done on a, a criteria basis. There's a range of uh, uh, assessment that is done on the material, the history, the cultural significance and the like to inform that view and that assessment which is done. Um, and that's done in comparison to other sites and, and uh, structures and places in the city. So we have a sort of a I guess, a stepped and range uh, between category one, 1A, and through to category four. The site now is quite important to um, the community in terms of its interrelationship to the statute. And that is uh, somewhat, uh, but that's not uh, about the category four listing in the local municipal heritage survey. That's about that for recognising that former history and use of that site. And yeah. I, might, I might just add that um, neither Greg or I are heritage experts. Um, when the city um, has prepared the local heritage survey previously and then as part of the process of review, we engage experts to undertake that review on our behalf. Um, so if council wants further information on the background, we'd be happy to provide that to you. But we're limited in our ability to provide kind of, if you like, detailed heritage information for you. Yeah, I mean, that, that seems to be the, the heart and, and soul of, of Two Rock when you think of, you know, the former Marine, Atlantis Marine site. And, and so any development, um, I would hope to, to see uh, community community consultation because they will be ultimately the local um, resident who will be using uh, those local shopping centres and they should be proud and should um, of their town and how is that to be developed. And it seems like the significance that they place on that side uh, seems to be disregarded. Do you have a question in that statement, Councillor Newer? Um, the, the, the question is, um, in terms of the heritage value, were, were, were they consulted with the local council, so with the local residents? So, um, through you, Chair, uh, as part of the preparation of the local heritage survey, there is 
community consultation that's undertaken. As part of the review of the survey, there will also be community consultation. I understand from my colleague, the Director of Community in Place, that community consultation or a report is due to be presented shortly to Council on the review to initiate the consultation, which will then follow. I think at the moment it's scheduled for June for a report to Council, and thereafter there would be community engagement with regard to that review process. Sorry, just one last question. Once um, the application has been approved, um, that's the DA application, what value is there for community consultation? I mean, the, the, the ship has already left the, the dock. The, the, there is community consultation that's undertaken as part of a development application as well. And obviously in this case, there has been significant um, interest and submissions made by the local community on their views on, on this application. That is summarised in the report, and that has been presented previously on the 9th of March to the JDAP and will again be presented back to them. It is the role and responsibility of the city to summarise those, that information, and it's also absolutely the role and responsibility of JDAP to take into consideration the submissions that have been made. Sorry, just one last question. Um, just in, on. in relation to the design review panel, I uh, understand right now that there's some design issues that, uh, as part of a condition uh, for approval, it, it, at what stage where the design panel says, no, we don't uh, um, agree with that uh, design, uh, where do you go from there? Uh, Thank you. Yes, so the design review panel is there to provide advice to the applicant. Um, they provide advice against the, um, the provisions in uh, design, the, um, the state government state planning policy on design review. So there's a procedure for them to uh, assess an application against uh, its various aspects. We then uh, work with the applicant to uh, see how they um, will address those points. Um, and they may come back for a second review by the design review panel um, and to assess any changes that they may have made. And ultimately, it's up to the applicant whether they engage with that process or not. Um, and then we'll make our determination. And, we'll, and if, if we're not satisfied with the, with the work that they're done, we may not support an application. Um, and cite the, the, the responses of the design review panel if that supports our argument. We eventually got to you, Councillor Wright. <laughs> Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, I just want to go back to Councillor Sangali's point, and she brought up some really valid points um, in, in relation to the submissions and also um, valid planning considerations. And I went to a Wagga new seminar for new councillors and one of the presenters was Donna Shaw and she's won various UDIA um, urban development, she won planner of the year. Um, and she put up a fact sheet for new councillors and, and it said submissions of what you can consider. And the reason why I want this, and there is a question coming towards the end, is I want this to formulate as part of, for next week's um, uh, council meeting. and the and. The points were what you can consider. The design of a proposal including height, bulk, scale and appearance. Impact to streetscapes, overshadowing, privacy and overlooking. Amenity impacts including traffic, noise, light and odour. Access and car parking arrangements proposed. Cultural and built heritage values. The compatibility of the proposal within the setting and any social impacts of the proposal. Environmental impacts such as air and water, pollution, erosion or land degradation and health and safety concerns. Adequacy of services, including infrastructure, public utilities, waste collection, uh, so forth. And the last point is loss of any community service or benefit. And the benefit is the viewpoint. The benefit is um, the, the the, herit the precinct of what was surrounded around the tourism and retail. So for, for me, coming from a point, you've got a roof that's borderline in terms of where the statue is. You've got fumes coming out of the top of a building. There's all these other concerns which are valid planning considerations. And you're looking at cultural and built heritage values. Um, you know, so my question would be, have these been looked at in terms of that? Are the JDAP members aware of this? Um, and obviously going forward, 
that the residents are also aware of these concerns as well to be able to potentially raise it the next JDAP or even for us to be able to provide that insight um, as councillors to, you know, in terms of that for JDAP. So my question would be, um, you know, has this been taken into consideration and also are residents aware of this as well? Uh, thank you. Yes, the summary that you provided is, uh, well, the, is essentially a summary of Clause 67 of the deemed regulations, which outline a, an extensive range of, app, of matters that the decision maker is to take into a consider, consideration when determining an application. It includes all of those items. So yes, that's, a, that's essentially a, a more friendly restating of that provision. That is the adopted statewide planning framework and it should be, and, and most people who are engaged with the process will be aware that that is the framework to assess applications against. Councillor Miles. Thank you, uh, Deputy uh, Mayor. Um, I just wanted to ask a question on the submissions that were presented as part of this, uh, sorry, the petition that was presented um, uh, to this application. I guess it was presented to JDAP um, I think that was suggested before, 1,200 people or the like. Uh, does JDAP uh, assess whether those people are actually residents of Two Rocks or is it up to the city to make sure that that's a legitimate uh, petition like we do when we receive them in here? What is their process when it comes to public uh, petitions? Um. Essentially, it's our process to look at the nature of the petition. So in this case, the petition is in the form of a, a submission on the application. Um, it's signed by uh, uh, people who have indicated their address and, and name so that we can see where they're located. Uh, we don't um, necessarily go through a procedure of verifying every single name and address on that property as we might do for a petition to council uh, because it is essentially a planning submission and it's the issues that are raised in that petition, in that letter that comes with those signatures. Obviously the number and the, the distribution of uh, people who have signed that is, is useful and helpful. Uh, but it is the planning issues that are raised in that submission that we are primarily interested in. Uh, for next week, is it possible just to have, uh, I don't need the names, but I'd like to know what they were signing. So I guess the forward at the top of the petition, uh, petitioning for whatever reason, uh, because um, it would be interesting to know whether it could be provided to councillors before the next meeting or whatever, it'd be interested to have. My other, my other uh, parts of that uh, issue is, um, I asked the question of uh, one of the residents earlier today during uh, the public uh, deputation time uh, of whether or not the local uh, member was able to get involved or, or be involved or was able to uh, ascertain anything and the answer was no. Um, what process does this council have to do anything other than change the aesthetics of this building? Thank you. So um, we can certainly provide the forward to the uh, petition to councillors, and we can uh, do that before the meeting next week. Um, it is summarised in the submissions. I just can't remember the precise number uh, in the order of submissions that the petition is, um, but there is a summary of that in there. Um, the second part, sorry, I just lost the uh, Well, part. if the local member, state member, has no authority to be able to be involved in this, as stated by the uh, question I asked earlier, what authority do we have as a council to oh, adjust, stop or uh, do anything in regard to this particular application? At this point, it's sort of the responsibility of the JDAP to make the final decision on the application. Uh, it's not the council's. At this, at this stage, the council can only provide advice and a recommendation to the JDAP about how to deal with, how the JDAP should deal with it. And uh, just looking at the uh, item uh, in the agenda on page 99, I noticed that the application was received on the 2nd of November of 21. Um, and the report due date was the 28th of February 22. 
um, and obviously the statutory process is only 90 days. Um, is the clock stopped on this because it's already been before JDAP or uh, because otherwise this could be a likely uh, deemed refusal and the applicant could just go off to SAT? Uh. And no, the applicant had um, sought an approval for an extension of time, which was agreed by the presiding member for a further eight weeks, uh, which I think takes it into early May when uh, the JDAP uh, report is due. And at which time, if the JDAP hasn't dealt with it by then, it would be a deemed uh, refusal and the applicant can then go to the uh, SAT uh, and ask the tribunal for approval? Uh, that's correct, yes. Councillor Sangali. No, Councillor Baker. Okay, yeah. no, okay. Councillor Baker. Thanks, Mark. Uh, thank you, Mr. Acting Chair. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, my question is just to Mark. Mark, my understanding is that the RAR was filed on behalf of the city with JDAP by, by you uh, under delegated authority, correct? Is that the case? Yes. It was preferred by administration um, through through to the um, JDAP, yes. But uh, pursuant to a delegated authority, correct? The ter sorry, pursuant to the terms of a delegated authority, correct? So there's no specific delegation that's been assigned from council to administration. Um, it's been practiced since, obviously, since the JDAP was initiated and the expectation of JDAPs is that um, uh, the, the city provides the responsible authority report. Yes, but in terms, I think you'd agree that in terms of the usual methodology with reports of this kind, given the importance, et cetera, and consequences and the community sentiment, it perhaps would have been preferable if the report went to a briefing session first to be discussed or even a forum aware of the 90-day rule referred to by Councillor Miles. But it, it would seem to me that it would be preferable if, as to the future. I know the horse is bolted on this one, perhaps, although, in effect, the RAR will be before the city next week for amendment, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it would, I think it would be preference to the future that the council does devise a policy so that uh, when dealing with the potentially contentious RARs that uh, the elected members of the residents of the city could be uh, heard from first, even before the design, the design panel stage, if it is a formal stage. I think you'd agree with that to the future. I think there's a dire need for a policy and, and community consultation, uh, subject to I suppose, with the de delay period with community consultation, subject to the applicant agreeing to the extension and, uh, and uh, JDAP not, not opposing the extension. But what, what are your views on that, please? <coughs> it certainly hasn't been um, Council's position up to this point, and the JDAPs have been in place for a considerable period of time without any significant issues being um, raised, in, in my experience. It would be for Council to make a determination if it wished to have these reports um, that are presented to JDAP to come to Council first and under what conditions um, that would occur, noting that there is a 90-day period in which to receive, um, undertake public consultation, um, consider any submissions, potentially go to um, the design review panel because they're typically bigger applications because of the, the nature. Um, so there is a time limit and constraints associated with that. Um, so, but obviously it's for council to make that decision. If council wishes administration to present reports in the future, um, then obviously administration will respond to that. There are significant um, um, administration requirements associated with that and resource implications if council were to make that decision because as a very large council, we do receive a significant number of JDAP applications and to present those to Council would have significant implications. And just as a follow-up, in, in terms of future, can I continue on, please, Mr. Chair? Uh, uh, just as a suggestion as well, is it possible to uh, amend the, I think it's a protocol, not a policy, in respect of the design panel, is it possible as to the future that, uh, in respect of any given DA in a particular ward, that at least the elected members of that ward could be deemed to be members of the design panel? So there is a, a consultation direct with the elected representatives of the residents in that ward, please. That, that could be considered as part of, as part of a future policy development. Um, I would guard against that. The whole purpose of the design review panel is to get expert technical advice and input. Um, you have an opportunity to consider applications when they're presented to you to provide your input. And obviously there are other mechanisms that you can provide. The whole purpose of the design review panel, as um, 
Mr. Bowering mentioned, there's eight members. The majority are architects, mostly with significant experience. There's also urban designers, landscape architects. There's a broad spectrum of technical advisors um, that assist in the process. I, don't, I wouldn't certainly um, offer the need for elected members to be part of that process. And just a final supplementary, Mr Chair. I apologise for labouring on this agenda item. It's a very important agenda item in the North Ward. Um, Would you agree, in essence, that once the city has filed its responsible authority report, the horse has largely bolted, so to speak, and if elected members want to have a say in it, then they're playing catch-up football. They're behind the eight ball. As the clock ticks away with Jada, please. Um, in response to that question, administration um, presents and prepares the responsible authority report based on council scheme provisions, based on council's policy, um, and obviously assesses any application against relevant structure plans that council has adopted. Um, and that's a very thorough process that's undertaken, similarly to when we present reports to council for its consideration. Thank you. Councillor Curtsy. Um, I just quickly want to ask a question. Many questions were asked tonight, and um, I was reading up here, so if I did miss it, and I'm asking it again, sorry. Um, if JDAP do um, disapprove of this application and uh, the developer take it to SAT, does um, SAT just approve it and the developer can do whatever they want, or will they follow the RAR conditions? Uh, it, thank you for the question. The, um, the SAT process uh, basically takes a, a look at the application of fresh or new. So they will reassess the application based on the planning framework and, and the SAT member will form a view if it gets to a hearing. So they will, they will then make a new decision on the proposal. That's so the they um, obviously look at the RAR that you guys have given to JDAP. As well? Indeed, they will look at all of the information that has formed part of the consultation. They, will, they may well call witnesses and uh, they may uh, visit the site, inspect. They will review all of the available information when they uh, make their decision. Thank you. Councillor, no, Councillor Baker. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr Acting Chair. Um, <clears throat> just bear with me. In terms of the process, once again, my understanding is that if the applicant is unsuccessful before JDAP, uh, they have a right to seek a review by the SAT, and the SAT will conduct what's called a hearing de novo. In other words, they'll start all over again. It's not as if you need grounds of appeal or grounds to seek a review. They will start all over again, so to speak, and consider absolutely everything. It'll be a fresh, brand new reconsideration for an independent judicial body with experts on board on the panel, normally, as I understand it. So, but, uh, so that is the case. So, in a nutshell, if that happens, and of course, the whole process in effect, well, essentially it starts all over again. There's a fresh assessment of the uh, DA by independent, uh, an independent, well, judicial body, correct? Uh, yes, that's correct. Um, yeah, it's a, a complete new assessment. I hesitate to ask, but are there any, any more questions, councillors? <laughs> nice hand move, Councillor Baker. <laughs> okay, there being no, there being no more questions there, um, we'll take planning from the top. I don't think there are any further items you wish to speak to. Um, so, Councillors, we go to item 4.1. Are there any questions on item 4.1? There's no indication there. 4.2 we have done. Item 4.3, Councillor Aitken. Yes. Just quickly on page 77, I noticed the Department of Planning, Lands and Heritage have not supported the amendment, um, yet uh, the state government aren't prepared to support extra water licences, so this land cannot be used for anything other than what they're trying to use it for. Um, would we be able to write to the Department of Planning, Lands and Heritage and say, if you don't support this for anything other than primary production, can you please get onto the Water Corp and increase our licences so that this land can be used?
for food production, which is what it's zoned for. Just thought that would be an idea. Can we do that? Thank you. Um, thank you, and through you, Chair. The, the, the um, Department of Planning, Lands and Heritage um, provided a report to the West Australian Planning Commission with regard to this issue and flagged some concerns. They haven't objected to it per se, um, but they've raised concerns with regard to its um, compliance with state planning policy. I think administration in its report has flagged the exact issue that you're raising, that not all of the land within uh, these zones can be used for food production, particularly if there isn't available water to do so. And that's part of our reasoning why we want to broaden the range of land use permissibility in these zones. Uh, further to that, I do agree with the recommendation here, but just these comments, would you agree, give us an opportunity to use that as evidence to ask for the water licences to be maintained or increased? Through, through you, Chair, certainly administration as part of its advocacy and as part of its other considerations has made the point very clearly to the state government around the importance of water availability um, for our food growers in uh, the rural areas of the city. So whether council wishes administration to do so again, I don't think it would be prudent to do so as part of this amendment and certainly that issue of the complexities associated with food production and water availability are, are already included within the report as part of our response to the points made by the state government. Councillor Baker. Uh, thank you. Uh, just a question, Mr Dixon, once again. Getting back to what Councillor Aiken just raised, raised, I think you'd agree that uh, in this particular case the permitted use is in effect an illusory, fictional use, because in reality you can't use the land for the purpose of you cannot use the land for the use attached to it because without to, to crude, you ain't got no water. So to talk in terms of use, it's a legal impossibility to use the land for the permitted purpose because there ain't no water. It seems to be an illusory use. With that being cruel, it seems to be a joke, a cruel joke. Would you agree? Um, through you, Chair, there, there is obviously water available within this area. It depends on the water licences um, as to where they're, they're available. Through this amendment, what administration and council, I think, is seeking to do is to broaden the range of land use permissibility to allow a car park to facilitate the storage of uh, caravans or boats or trailers um, where they're not able to do so. And it typically would be in areas that um, food production or agricultural production isn't that, that viable. So it's really to broaden the range of opportunities within this area. Councillor Miles. Yeah, thanks, uh, Deputy. Um, I just wanted to ask a couple of questions, and I do know the answer, but I want to put it on the record because it was brought up by Mr Stewart uh, earlier this evening. I'm not sure whether Mr Stewart was a planner or not, um, but one of the questions that were raised, and we've made it very clear that these uh, car park uh, land use in rural uh, zones um, is for uh, people to park a boat, jet ski, uh, you know, trailers and the like, um, and we already do have them, as we know. Um, uh, he brought up the issue of, is a bus a commercial uh, item? Uh, obviously, he's referring to uh, the, a bus that was situated out on the Neves Road site. Um, uh, what is the difference between a bus and something that can be parked in one of these car parks? Um, so I think in, in the amendment itself, what it seeks to do is allow um, uh, private vehicles to be parked there for private or personal use only. What it doesn't support is vehicles used for trade, professional or the, any other commercial purposes. So I think that's the distinction. If it's perhaps a bus could be stored there, but if it's somebody's private bus that they just use for their own private enjoyment, then that would be permissible, but it certainly wouldn't be allowing commercial, commercial bus storage to be allowed within these locations. It really has to follow and align with the definition of car park in, your, in, in our scheme. Uh, yes, yeah, so it has to be a private registration as opposed to commercial uh, bus or the like. 
Um, the other question that comes up, um, uh, which I, th I thought was um, also uh, valid, that if you have a food van, which is towable, is not motorised, is that something that could be parked in one of these sites, uh, bearing in mind that it is just a trailer uh, with some fancy signage on the side, what's inside doesn't matter? Um, so if it's a licensed uh, professional commercial vehicle, then no, that wouldn't accord with the amendment as being um, presented. If it's somebody's personal trailer they use occasionally for private use then or personal use, then yes, that's the definition that's included. If you refer to page 75 of the report, I think, and other, other areas, it specifically makes reference to the conditions in which we'd like to impose. And, uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Mr Dixon. And the other issue is obviously this is just an amendment to add the use to our scheme. Um, but everybody that, that if they, if even if the Neves Road site eventually gets their amendment or if this amendment goes through the commission for the city as a whole, uh, every single one of those businesses would still need to lodge a development application uh, to seek approval uh, to have that particular um, use permitted within their lot. Is that correct? That is exactly correct, yes. This amendment just seeks to add an additional use um, that may be permissible within these two zones. Exactly the, same, the point that you're making that it would also require a subsequent development application and a lot of the issues that were raised as part of sub, uh, public submissions are focused on amenity issues um, and the visual impact of uh, having a, a potential car uh, car park of this nature located adjacent to them. Administration would assess each of those application on its merits. So uh, just to, to, I guess, get some public clarification. So if a, um, uh, uh, I don't know the number of the, what, the, the amendment for Neves Road, because obviously that's the one that, that people have referred to the most. If that uh, gets its amendment through the commission, uh, it would still then need to lodge a DA uh, and the city may reject that on grounds that it's too close to other structures and that. So uh, I'm trying to clarify, just because you get an amendment doesn't mean to say you're going to get a development application to actually use that amendment that you're seeking. Um, correct, yes. So the, this amendment just seeks, simply seeks to add car park as a potential additional use. If that is supported by council and the commission and the minister for planning and then is gazetted as part of our scheme. Any subsequent application would be assessed around, particularly against clause 67 of our scheme, which talks about all of the issues um, that councillor Wright raised earlier as valid planning consideration. So access, visual impact, um, amenity, noise, dust, all of those issues would be considered as part of a a development application that would need to be lodged subsequently. So, uh, as I say, so you might want to seek an amendment, you may get your amendment, but you may not get your DA. Correct. Are there any further questions on this item, councillors? There being none. And just before we go, councillors, I think if we could just ensure that our phones are on silent. We, we ask that of the, uh, the gallery. I think it's best we also do the same. Um, we have done item 4.4. .4. If we uh, are now on to item 4.5, are there any questions? There being none. Thank you, Mr Dixon and Mr Barring. I think you've earned it all at dollars this evening. <laughs> Well and truly. Councillors, with your indulgence, I'd just like to suggest that we move on to item 4.10, which might hold a, a little bit more of focus for the, for the gallery remaining. Um, Ms Jennings, did you wish to speak to this item and introduce the item um, so as we can uh, discuss it and uh, have some questions answered potentially? Thank you, Deputy Chair. Uh, I don't actually have anything further to present other than what's in the report, so I'm happy to take questions. Councillors, are there any questions on this item? Yep, 
Councillor Berry. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. I'd just like to thank all the community members who spoke to us tonight and previously and took the time to share their personal experiences. I'd like to state I wish state government who have bought in the mandates had provided a forum to also have community members share their experiences and was open to listening as we have been at the City of Wanneroo. I am aware that there is a mental health impact to those unable to access facilities currently as it is an area I work in. Representations from that sector Okay, I'll leave it till next week, but I would yep. like to foreshadow that I'd like to make some amendments. Okay, yep. thank, thank you. you. Councillor Miles. Yeah, thank you. And, and uh, I too want to uh, ask uh, a couple of questions. Uh, was it Miss Jennings or Mr? The Director of Corporate. Director of Corporate. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I, saw, I, I thought it was Mark still. Um, one of the questions uh, that I had, uh, Miss Jennings, is has local being local government uh, we are obviously the the face of governments both federal and state um, there's been no other method for residents to be able to uh, ask and request these questions is there no other uh, avenue that that residents and ratepayers have apart from this mechanism uh, to to voice their opinion about uh, what they seem to be what they see as being a wrong Uh, through the Deputy Chair, a Deputy Mayor rather, um, I think there's probably a few ways that people can use. They can contact their local member, be it state or federal, but state's more pertinent in this case because it's a state level emergency that has been declared um, right to state government. I think there's various ways like that. I couldn't tell you all the ways it might be available, but they're some of the ones that bring, spring to mind. Oh, um, thank you, uh, uh, Ms Jennings. Um, if you could maybe talk a bit closer, you, you're a bit soft over here with your mask. Um, the other question I had, uh, a question with regard to the uh, Emergency Management uh, Committee, and I know you've put it into the, um, uh, the report. Um, can you highlight uh, what that function is and whether you uh, you had been meeting uh, with regard to any COVID agenda? Through the Deputy Mayor, there was mention of the State Emergency Management Act in the report. Um, the way that the State Emergency Management Act works is it identifies a number of hazards that are um, then controlled by various groups. Depending on the hazard, you'd be probably well aware of the fire hazard, which has some jurisdiction for local government to be responsible, but even that will escalate to the state at a various point. In the case of health and pandemic, this one escalated at being a pandemic. The state, um, the chief health officer is the controller of this particular hazard, and hence the state is in charge of this particular hazard. So that's the context that I've put it into the that we've put into the report to highlight this is a state level control. Okay, so so the way I understand it then is uh, we only use the local emergency management committee when it is a very localised issue, um, but because obviously it was dealt with at a statewide, it used the state uh, emergency management uh, team uh, with that regard. Um, as part of, and I, and I appreciate that Councillor um, um, Berry uh, is, is going to foreshadow an amendment. I'll talk to her after, because um, I do believe that, um, and I'm not sure whether this has been done or, or anything like that, whether uh, the local um, members were advised of this meeting or whether they uh, are going to be given a copy of the recording, uh, courtesy of, of Council, so they can hear the submissions uh, that were put by residents uh, on the day concerned. Uh, is that something that you considered doing or do you need that putting in as a amendment? 
Um, through Deputy Mayor, sorry, I apologise, are you talking about the local state members? Is that who you're suggesting? Uh, yes, the ones that are within our boundary. I would like them to uh, have a copy of that meeting. I think uh, the residents that came along were very, very concise about the challenges that they dealt with uh, over the past 18 months, two years. Um, and I think it's only fair that we pass that information on to the local members. Um, I'm not sure whether that's something you, you've thought about doing or whether you need us to ask you. Um, through the Deputy Mayor, the recording will remain on the actual website of the City of Wanneroo. Mr CEO. Um, for you, um, Mr Deputy Mayor, um, Councillor Miles, there might be an opportunity to add that to recommendation three for an amendment. Um, if, I think as um, Mrs Jennings alluded to, it's, it is available through our web at any point in time, but we could draw our local members of parliament's attention to how to access that to further understand our local community's views as expressed at the electors meeting. Uh, yeah, I, I think I think uh, I think that's something, and I'll talk to Councillor Berry on that because I think it's important uh, understanding uh, that their role is very busy. Um, so I think it's important that by concising it down onto a, a, a thumb drive or something, they might be able to listen to it on the way into Parliament or something like that, um, and hear directly from their own constituents. Councillor Baker, thank you. Through the chair, just a question to. Uh, uh, Ms Jennings, regarding paragraph three of the recommendation, it says in the second line that the council decides X, Y, Z, and I quote, that the mayor on behalf of the local government will write to the named state government representatives for purposes as detailed in this report. Uh, <coughs> uh, my question is this, and that is that on the, on the basis that the uh, writ calling the forthcoming federal election is issued in the next uh, seven days, which seems to be the case, and on the basis of the Mayor's uh, irrevocable undertakings that she will stand aside, not resign, stand aside as Mayor uh, once the writ calling the election has been issued. Uh, is, it, is it the case that it's implied in paragraph three that the uh, Deputy Mayor will forward the letter referred to in paragraph three given that she would have stood aside as per undertaking? Or it may well be she plans on putting up a motion next week whereby she's given formal leave of absence by the city. What, 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 would, be the, what would happen in those circumstances, please? Mr. Oh, CEO. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you. Um, for you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. In that circumstance, if the Mayor um, is unavailable to do it for, for the reason as identified by Councillor Baker, the Deputy Mayor would assume that role. One more question. Councillor Baker. Uh, thank you. And the other question relates to uh, a follow on from what the, the questions that Councillor Miles uh, raised regarding what action can the members of the, uh, the group uh, take? to seek some sort of, uh, not redress, but to uh, seek answers. Uh, I think might, uh, and I think you'd agree, Councillor Jennings, uh, sorry, Nolan, that uh, the standing orders for the Legislative Assembly have a specific provision which enables uh, local members of parliament, state members of parliament, to present grievance speeches in, in the chamber to the relevant minister res responsible for whatever the subject matter of the grievance is. And uh, the same applies, as I understand it, in, uh, in the upper house and also, of course, they can use question time to air the concerns raised by the persons who attended at the special electors meeting. Do you, you agree that that's the case? I can assist if you like. I, I assume as you were a state member you would know exactly that, but so I'm, I'll agree. The answer is yes, thank you. Councillor Rowe. Uh, thanks, Deputy Mayor. I just have two questions on this. Um, the first one is I'm, I'm aware that sort of a number of councils across the metropolitan and the southwest region uh, had similar special elected meetings over the last month. So the time frame is fairly recent on all of these. I think Fremantle was probably the first to start off with. So I just wanted to ask, is administration aware of any other Perth Metropolitan Council that has adopted a pro-choice advocacy position, as is the request and recommendation of many of the people who spoke at the electors meeting. Uh, Deputy Mayor, we're, we're not uh, aware particularly of anyone that's taken that position. I'm sorry, I missed your last question. Councillor um, Ruff. And then the second part of the question, uh, just in terms of what Councillor Miles said before about um, members of the uh, Legislative Assembly or the Council having an opportunity to um, 
present matters there. Uh, Director, is it, is it true from your understanding that petitions can also be tabled in both the Legislative Council and the Legislative Assembly? Uh, through Deputy Mayor, yes, I believe that's the case. Councillor Baker. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, just as a follow on from what uh, uh, Councillor Rose just said, isn't it the case though, however, that when petitions are filed, the, the government is not compelled to respond to the petitions? As for example, we are. If we get hit with a petition, we're going to have a special, well, subject to the numbers, of course. We're going to have, I mean, the numbers of the, in terms of the road payer numbers. Uh, excuse me. Uh, that, that is the case, as far as you're aware. The government's not compelled to respond to petitions tabled in state parliament or either house, whereas councils are subject to the threshold number for in the, of the number of petitions being achieved. It's okay. To the Deputy Mayor, I can answer the question about the council, but I'm not totally okay with the state level. Are there any other questions, councillors? There being none. Um, we'll take the opportunity to go back to um, assets. I don't believe there are any items from assets this evening. So we're now on to um, community development, community in place, community development. Yes, thank you, Deputy Mayor. There's one item this evening from community in place, um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Are there any questions, councillors, on this item? Councillor Berry. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. I've only got a couple of questions. Um, the report actually gives us a breakdown of the expenses, and obviously City of Wanneroo is going to contribute $105,801.50 of that program over a three-year period. Is all of the benefit from that program with the rest of the money being funded elsewhere, is it all of that benefit felt within the City of Wanneroo? In other words, are we paying for just it, for that to be delivered in the City of Wanneroo? Because this charity is based in Maylands. Thank you. Uh, yes, through you, Deputy Mayor, as has been the case with the previous sponsorship arrangements that the city's had with the Constable Care Foundation, um, we're paying for the delivery of the program within the City of Wanneroo. Councillor Berry. Thank you. And one further question. Given the budget pressures, do we know if the City of Joondalup use this program and if we could actually facilitate something jointly with them to carry on delivering it and therefore split the cost? Uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, I'd need to check specifically if the City of Joondalup funds the program. I do note that there are 15 other um, metropolitan local governments who similarly sponsor the program for their particular local governments, but I'll need to check if the City of Joondalup does the same. Thank you. Councillor Wright. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Just one question from me on page 438. Um, it says, pending council approval, administration will develop a suite of market, marketing collateral to maximise the impact to the relationship. Is, is this the role of the city for this program or is this can not be left to um, the Constable Care Foundation in terms of developing their own marketing material within the city? And the reason why I ask that is because is this extra marketing collateral included in the overall funding amount or, or is this additional on top of that? Uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, the intention here is that we will provide to Constable Care um, the suite of marketing collateral that we want them to use that represents or recognises the city's sponsorship contribution. So it's not the marketing collateral for the program itself, it's the marketing collateral for what we would require um, the Constable Care Foundation to use on behalf of the city. Are there any other questions on this item, councillors? Councillor Miles. Uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Deputy Mayor. Um, having uh, what's been said by some of the other councillors, uh, Ms Terrelink, um, and I was just looking and obviously understand that the, the Founder Constable Care Foundation does have some good programs. Um, it, I'm assuming this is going to be delivered to only a certain number of schools over the three years. Is the idea that every school within the city sees this uh, program or is the city sort of saying we want it directed in one area more than another? How is it actually going to be carried out um, within, the, within those age groups? 
Uh, through you, Chair. Um, the intention would certainly be, and if we look at the engagement summary for 2019 to 2021, which is our previous um, arrangements, the Constable Care Foundation delivered 276 performances to 32,000 children, um, which would cover, if not all, um, certainly a fair amount of the schools within the city of Wanneroo. So the intention would certainly be um, that the program would be available to all schools in the city of Wanneroo and also um, delivery of the program through other community-based um, areas like libraries and that type of thing as well. Could we maybe just ask for a bit of clarity on the delivery of the program, please? For you, Deputy Mayor, yes, I can include some further information. Thank you, Mrs. Terrell. Thank you, Councillor Baker. Uh, thank you. Uh, just a question to Ms. Uh, thank you, Mr. Acting Chair. Just a question to Debbie Terrell again. My recollection is, is that you said earlier that the program would be provided to some, but not all, schools. In terms of it being provided, to, determining which schools to be, it should be provided to. What's the selection criteria for identifying the schools? Is it based on schools within a? Uh, I don't know. I don't want to. Well, I won't come up with some hypotheticals, but you'd think there'd be a selection, a selection criteria that would be referred to in determining how to identify which schools perhaps have a need for programs of this kind. How do you pick and choose, in other words? Thank you. Uh, yes, through you, Deputy Mayor, the intention would certainly be that our youth staff work very closely with schools, and so through that mechanism we would identify schools that may be having particular issues, um, and then with our um, sponsorship arrangements and partnership with the Constable Care Foundation, we can then um, direct the program to particular schools if we're recognising that there are certain issues within those schools. Thank you. Are there any further questions on this item, councillors? There are none. I think that finishes uh, community in place. We then move on to corporate strategy and performance. Uh, Mrs Jennings, welcome back again. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, of the five reports, there's four reports remaining after having um, gone through with 4.10. So um, two monthly reports and one that's come from Audit and Risk Committee and one that's come back from previous um, referral back. So um, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Councillors, we'll take them from the top. Um, item 4.7. Councillor Rowe. Uh, thanks, Deputy Mayor. Um, on page 444, it shows the um, operating grant subsidies and contributions as being uh, significantly higher for May than in other months. I just wanted to ask the director if she could provide any clarity why this may be the case for the month of May. Thank you. Through the Deputy Mayor, there um, actually are a high number of grants expected to arrive in May, hence the why the budget is higher. So um, I do have a list, there's uh, um, Lottery West grant, a DFIS grant, a uh, federal grant, a Main Roads WA grant, a Department of Transport grant and a fire mitigation activity grant. So it's just all happening in May. Uh, and the right. second part of that question was on page 448, it looks at the materials and contracts and it sees that it was significantly higher than the budgeted uh, level for the month of February. I know the graph on that page doesn't have uh, the raw data for the, uh, for the month of March yet, but is there any evidence that the director is aware of to show that this trend may be stabilising? Uh, through the Deputy Mayor, uh, you may remember that we've talked about there being um, delay in some invoices for Ryle while we were implementing a new system in uh, December. And you'll note that November and December actuals were quite low. So January's a catch up, February's a further catch up. So I expect it to even out from now on. Are there any, for Councillor Miles? Uh, yeah, just to, uh, I guess, to clarify on page 445, Ms Jennings, um, uh, we've got uh, the fees and charges. Um, we've got, uh, for February, uh, lower facility booking income. Is that just mainly due to the COVID uh, situation we're in, or um, is there something else that we're not noticing? 
Through Deputy Mayor, I think that's probably the most likely reason for it. Any further questions on this item, councillors? Councillor Miles. Sorry, uh, Deputy. The other question I did have, uh, Ms Jennings, was lower rubbish removal fee income. Um, it's $80,000. Uh, booking fee of 100, yes, yeah, so $81,000. What, what is lower rubbish removal fee income? Because we don't do commercial. Through you, Chair, that, is, that relates to the illegal dumping and, and litter, litter removal and also some of the construction sites um, rubbish removal. Uh, I just wondered why is it called lower rubbish removal fee income of eighty one thousand? It's normally the month to it's less than the month month to date or year to date budget at that point in time. A good title. Any further questions on this item, councillors? Councillor Berry. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Only one, and it relates to page 440, the bottom paragraph that explains the unfavourable variances. I note some are favourable, not unfavourable, but the higher materials and contract expenses of 4.8 million, can I assume that that's going to a trend that we can continue, that we will see for the rest of the year, so that variance will get bigger month on month? Thank you. Through uh, Deputy Chair, um, there could also be the fact that we have got that higher payment coming in February as well. So whilst there have been some escalation in costs, we did actually um, pay more invoices. So that's why it showed up a bit higher in February. So we'll see how March travels really. Any further questions on this item, councillors? There being none, we move on to item 4.8, warrant of payments. Councillor Baker. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I referred to page 469 of the agenda, uh, specifically the entry number 122701. Uh, the uh, payee was Spare Parts Puppet Theatre Inc. The particulars of the, uh, the payment of $2,002 was for uh, if I'm reading it correctly, it might be a typo, but I'll just read what it says. Puppet workshops. Uh, it, it, would you agree that it's not the core business of local government in the state, pursuant to the provisions of the, uh, of the Local Government Act, which set out core responsibilities to be funding puppet workshops? Further, what were the nature of the puppet workshops? Were they for, for children? Uh, were they, uh, I don't know, for adults? Or were they were like you know, political puppetry training, so to speak? Uh, can you provide some further particulars, please? Uh -huh. Uh, through Deputy Mayor, uh, I'll take that one on notice, please. Thank you, Ms Jennings. Councillor Baker. Thank you, Mr Acting Chair. Uh, next, if I go to, uh, where are we, page 471, at the bottom entry, 122780, very bottom of the page. Pay E was access projects and construction, the amount 3,769.91, and over the page, the top line over the page, which I believe is linked uh, to the item, it's split over two pages. The particulars reads refund application done for incorrect shy. What does it mean? Someone paid us a fee, whereas the fee was payable to another shy because the issue of the subject land was located in another shy. It was just some sort of an error thing, was it? Ooh, please. Um, I'll take that on notice, but it looks like someone's gone to the wrong place and put in an application and we've refunded it. That's what it looks like, but I will find out a bit more. Uh, Councillor Baker. I apologise, uh, sir. I, I, normally I'd have my questions typed, but my uh, secretary is on, on, on annual leave at the moment, my typist, so to speak. Uh, next, uh, page 479. Second, I'm sorry. Third entry from the bottom. The number is 1354. The pay is Delta Echo Proprietary Limited. The payment is 16434 It says it's a 50% payment towards the total project cost of the social advocacy agenda. 
what's meant by that is it's actually a case where this company has been engaged to develop a social advocacy agenda, or is it uh, training in relation to social advocacy or some sort of hybrid? But could I just have some further particulars, please? Thank you. Uh, yes, through you, Deputy Mayor. So, um, as councillors would be aware from um, information that's been provided, the city is doing some work on around a social advocacy agenda. So we have our infrastructure advocacy agenda and we're doing some work around social advocacy agenda to understand what our community needs are in terms of services and developing a strategy for the city to ensure that those services are available to the community through advocacy. Thank you. If I could, Baker. Yes, page 489 of the agenda. The item is item one, expense item 1622. The pay is Judith Birchall, particulars language consultancy hyphen Wanneroo Festival. The payment was $1,000. What was the nature of Judith Birchall's language expertise? What was the expertise in which particular language? Or is it referring to, I suppose, language, languages other than a language body of words, so to speak, so or certain words within the language? What, do, what's the, what was the payment for? To do what? Uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, um, we did engage uh, Judith to provide some language services in terms of the Wanneroo Festival, which is a multicultural festival, um, and the intention was that that would be part of the, the delivery of the festival. Um, while we've had to cancel the festival, unfortunately, because of the COVID restrictions, the intention would be that that work has been done and will be able to be used um, for a proposed two, 2023 um, Wanneroo Festival. Councillor Baker. Uh, so, uh, yes, thank you. Uh, uh, if I could go now to page 490. Three calls away down the page. There's an uh, uh, expense item 1641. The pay is the Mayor Tracy Roberts. There's the subject matter is the payment of a monthly allowance. The amount of the monthly allowance is $11,248.47. Uh, are you aware, or is the CEO aware, as to whether, on the basis of the writ calling the federal election is issued in the next seven days, and the Mayor will stand aside or seek leave of absence? Are you aware as to whether it is the Mayor's intention to seek to be paid that allowance during the election period, up to and including polling day and the result of the poll in the Federal Pierce being published, please? Uh, Councillor Baker, I think it probably would be unfair to actually ask the staff to respond to that. That would be a matter for the Mayor. But I have no knowledge as to whether, whether the Mayor has discussed this with the CEO. So I, it may well be hypothetically she has, and it may well be hypothetically the CEO is aware of what her position is. I, I agree, perhaps it, we should put that before the but It may well be that, I mean, hypothetically, the writ could issue before next week's ordinary council meeting and the mayor. Yeah, yeah, sorry? Yeah. Oh, that's, a separate, that's a separate question. About the other candidate. That's yeah, right. Councillor Baker, res respectfully, it might be something you'd wish to put in writing and ask the, the mayor directly. Yes, sir. Uh, Another one. I've got a couple here. I apologise. Normally, put these in writings, you know. I apologise, please. Uh, next page, 493 of the agenda. Uh, expense item is 1714. The payee is Tony Panqui, I think it is. The amount is $40,150, and it was for public artwork that he uh, prepared, as I understand it, for the Grum Bossom Community Centre. Uh, was that a case where we were preparing, he was preparing a new artwork, or he was replacing? damaged or stolen or removed artwork, and what was what, what was the correlation in terms of the monetary sum uh, 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 relative to, that, that was paid relative to the, if you like, the, the cost of the artwork that had, had been damaged or required replacement or stolen, please? Just, it's just, it's, it seems that $40,000 is a lot of money for a, a work of art at a community centre. Well, we have scores and scores of community centres uh, in the city. That many areas are crying out for them, and they, all they've got is, what, three demandable toilets bolted or weighted down to the playing pitch adjacent to the sporting complex, or the fields, I should say, that's what it was. Through you, Deputy Mayor, this was an insurance payment for a piece of artwork that was stolen from the Gum Blossom Community Centre that was actually valued quite significantly. Um, and we commissioned a replacement piece, but it's all being paid for oh, through right. insurance oh, funding. E excellent, I wasn't aware of that, but that's great news, excellent. Uh, next, uh, if I uh, you could go to page 494 of the uh, agenda, the third item from the top, expense item 1721, uh, subject matter is WA Electoral Commission, payment $546,374.95. Particulars, the cost, as I understand it, of engaging or the city outsourcing its statutory election duties, which it has the right to do, uh, in respect of the 2021 local government ordinary elections. Uh, I think you'd agree that it's a very high sum of money. But my question is this. On the basis that, in due course, the uh, 
the Mayor is elected as the new federal member for Pearce. And on the basis that, of course, there, is, there will be a vacancy in respect of our office, and on the basis of what we've previously been informed of by the CEO, that there will be a need for a mayoral by-election, uh, and on the basis that the city again engages the services of the Electoral Commission to conduct that mayoral by-election, what will the cost to ratepayers be of conducting that mayoral by-election, which is an election throughout the whole of the city, as opposed to a mere, perhaps, by-election in one ward, in, 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 in circumstances, of course, where Councillor Aiken may be Councilor successful. Councillor Baker, if I could just draw your attention to the question being asked on a specific item on the warrant of payments and not a hypothetical item that may or may not occur. It's unrelated to the warrant of payments. Yes. Well, if, if I could respond, it's not a hypothetical question. Uh, I think it's more likely than not that either Tracy Roberts or Linda Aiken will be elected as the uh, new member for Pearce. It's not hypothetical. It's a very real position. It's either be, it'll be, be either A or B. So it's not hypothetical. It'll happen. A or B. Councillor so, Baker, the I mean, question at hand is item 4.8 yep. on the warrant of payments. That's Your correct. question is hypothetical and unrelated to the warrant of payments. It, it, it is directly related because if the last local government election... Councillor Baker, if I could, if I'm, I'm going to rule that out of order because it's unrelated to the item well, under discussion. I, if, I, if, please feel free to ask questions on the items of the warrants of payments as uh, they're listed, please. I, I wish to take a point of order and could you please, Mr Chair, listen to my point of order first before ruling on it rather than cutting my point of order submissions dead, so to speak, halfway through them, I just utter them. The, the bottom line is this, and this is a very important... Councillor uh, Baker... If I could just you, continue with my point of order, please. Councillor Baker, if you have a point of order, put your point of order. A, a, a debate does isn't masqueraded as a point of order. Please put your point yeah, of order. Uh, well, that's what I'm doing. And please do not interrupt me as I'm endeavouring to put my point of order, please, if you can, with respect, with the greatest of respect. The, the bottom line is this. The point of order is this. The issue is to question uh, the issue of this... Councillor uh, Baker, that is not a point of order. I'd rule that uh, I haven't, outright. I haven't even... No, it's not a point of order, Councillor well, Baker. On what, standing orders, under standing orders, what is your point of order? Well, you've ruled it out as being out of order. How can, I, how can you rule a point of order as being out of order when the point of order hasn't even been put? And then you're asking the question, now, what's your point of order? That, and you said a few seconds ago, and there is, is no point of order. Look, is, I'll, I'll just forget about it. I, I won't raise the issue. This is not a decision-making forum, nor is it there an opportunity to actually raise a point of order. There is, well, it's a discussion forum whereby uh, the agenda is here for discussion. Ca Councillor Baker, points. it's not a discussion forum. The opportunity is to ask questions. We are on, and I'll repeat again, item 4.8, the items that appear on the warrants of payments. If, if you could, have questions on yes, the warrant of I'll, payments, as yes. opposed to hypothetical and likely no. things that may or may not occur in the future, they are quite different to the warrants of payments. The question is this, given that it cost over half a million dollars to conduct those elections, and the rate pays paid for those elections half, Count, half a million Baker, dollars. Councillor Baker, I'll I, rule it out of order because now you're getting into opinion and debate. That is not the form well, of process for... Point of briefing. order, please. Half a million dollars isn't getting into debate. It, debate. it is a fact. Half a million dollars is a lot of money for a council, a council to pay for local government elections. That is, that is the point. The question is very simple. Is it likely to cost the same in the event there's a mayoral by-election or will be less in the event that there is Councilor a council by-election? Councillor Baker, by again, it's, this is debate, I, and it, I, I'll stop you there. There is no more discussion on this item. Thank you. So you're preventing me from asking that question or an answer being given to that question. I've already asked so the question. It's a hypothetical question. There's it's nothing... not hypothetical with respect, sir. Councillor Baker, there is no more discussion on this. Thank you. Councillor Miles. Yeah, thank you, uh... Deputy Mayor, um, on page 475, Ms Jennings, um, there's an item 1258, it's called 1258, linked in Singapore for $45,000. Um, it just says uh, employment services. Um, what would that be or how is that an employment service um, that we would be contracted to? I'm assuming, I'm not sure. 
Yes, through the chair. We use uh, LinkedIn for a couple of things, mainly for attracting employees. So we do do searches on LinkedIn, and there's also a cost for actually keeping our page up to date. So between those things, yeah, that's where that goes to. So it's a very popular um, professional um, site, um, and people do search for jobs there, and we can search for people on there as well. And just to actually, just one second. Yep. Sorry, Councillor Moss. Councillor Berry, apologies. You were you had the next call. I'll go to you first, and I'll come back to you, Councillor Miles. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. I'm looking at page four seven eight. It's item one three one one. It's nine hundred and thirty one thousand seven hundred and seventy dollars eighty seven cents, and it's referred to as loan interest payment. Is that loan interest payment covering a year? Is it a fixed rate? And how long is the loan that it relates to going to go for, for budget purposes going forward? Thank you. Um, Deputy Mayor, I'll just have to check which loan that is, so I'll have to take that one on notice. Thank you. Councillor Miles, sorry. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, uh, Deputy Mayor. Um, just, uh, I just wanted to ask the CEO, I guess, but through uh, Ms Jennings, the the cost of the elections back in October, it says on here 500000 was that in line with what we were estimating at the time or was there extra charges because they, they put out more uh, postal vote applications? Because uh, I thought it was going to be about four hundred, uh, but that looks a little bit higher than what I originally thought. Um, thank you, um, Mr Deputy Mayor. I'll have to take that on notice and have a look at what the um, estimate was and how that relates to the one. Unless Mrs Jennings knows what the estimate is offhand, I, I'd, I'd need to verify what the assessment was. The av estimate was originally. Um, through Deputy Mayor, I believe that is the same as the estimate. Councillor Baker. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, yes, uh, if I could refer to page 504. The agenda, the uh, expense item is 2035. Uh, the pay is the Perth Symphony Orchestra. Uh, the amount is $43,780. This is for one night, I might add, or a couple of, a few hours. And the, the infants, uh, sorry, the particulars read simply under the stars, 20 February 2022. Now, without in any way uh, uh, criticising the, the holding of that event, it was fantastic. Uh, the question is this My understanding is that the Perth Symphony Orchestra approached the city, not the other way around to do a performance in the city, and that uh, I'm not sure who, but someone within the city, admin or what have you, I'm not sure, identified the venue. My understanding was that they agreed to do this on a, vo on a voluntary basis. Uh, that was my understanding. So is that not the case? Hence, we've been charged $43,780. That's the first question. And the next question is, does that sum also include everything else? The stage, the lighting, the height of the stage, lighting, security, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So is that just for the, the orchestra for that? event that lasted a few hours, or was that for the whole event from start to finish, please? Mrs Terrell, uh, Through you, Deputy Mayor, my understanding is that it is for the Perth Symphony Orchestra, but it does also include items like staging and lighting and that type of thing as well. Oh, oh it does. OK, that's fair enough. Yep, yep. Councillor Baker. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I referred to page 512 of the agenda. Uh, it's the second item from the very top of the page. Uh, I'm only asking this question because I've never seen this before in, in warrants. The expense payment is, uh, number is 2214. The pay E is the Cat Welfare Society Incorporated. Uh, the particulars impoundment fees, hyphen community safety, and the figure is $6,627.50. Is that the impoundment fee that we were charged by that group for a period, and if so, what period? And without, without trying to, uh, if you like, uh, you know, we tri trivialise the issue. What does that represent on a per cat basis? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, thank That's you. a lot of cats. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Subject to the breed of the cat. Cats don't have market values, of course. I don't know how that figure's arrived at. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, I can't um, answer for the number of cats, but I do know that we don't have um, adequate facilities to store cats for very long at the current animal care centre, um, hence the reason why we actually um, send the cats to the 
Cat Welfare Society for them to impound them because we do have to keep them for a certain period of time. Um, I'll need to take on notice how long that payment is for. Supplementary, please, sir. Councillor. Uh, in terms of, in terms of uh, the cats being impounded, impounded, without going into details, what happens to them thereafter? Are they, uh, what's the word, loaned out as rescue cats or are they, are they sold or are they euthanised? I mean, uh, I'm just curious. I didn't know that so many cats... Well, I don't know how many cats are represented in that figure, but we, we have a hell of a cat problem in this uh, city, it would seem. Yeah, so what happens to them thereafter, please, once they've, they've reached the cat pound, please? Uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, my understanding would be that the, the Cat Haven or the Cat Welfare Society would look to rehome the cats wherever possible. Thank you. Councillor Wright, again we get to you. Thank you. I'm always happy to be patient. <laughs> um, in, uh, just one question from me in relation to item 1547, which is on page 486, and page 506, 2072, which is the same photographer for the Pioneers Lunch and the Freedom of Entry. Um, my, my question to administration is, um, from, from my record, I've only seen two of the photos published, and one of them was of the mayor greeting um, the squadron, and the other photo was obviously um, us as a council and a group one. Um, but my question would be, um, is, is this value for money from a city's point of view, pending that residents can't even look at the photos, there's no album created on Facebook that um, residents can scroll through. I've noticed the Pioneers Lunch in 2019 was actually published on Facebook. Um, 2020, there's no record. 2021, there was also no record. Um, just coming from an elected member's point of view, um, obviously I know there's concerns around privacy. Is, is this something that the city, that we don't have a standard of when people attend civic events, that these are, this is automatically included in invitations, that photography may be done at an event? So that would be my question. Uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, the reason that there would be no photos from 2020 is that there was no um, Pioneers function because of the COVID situation. Um, in regard to the photos, then um, we can certainly, if it's um, approved by the attendees, um, make albums available on Facebook as we do with the citizenship ceremonies that we hold. Um, that is something that we can consider. Thank you. Any further questions, councillors? Okay, we move on then, moving on to item 4.9, which is the uh, quarter two corporate performance report. Any questions? There being none, we move then on to 4.10 we've done. 4.11 is the appointment of delegate to Heritage Services Advisory Group. Um, and we would be looking for nominations for this when it comes to council again next week. Councillors, any questions? All right. That does. Uh, that's us covering um, corporate performance. Uh, we move then on to the chief executive office, the office of the CEO reports. Four point one two. CEO. Thank you, and for you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Um, there are two items presented this evening, noting that item 4.13, review of the City of Wanneroo Standing Orders Local Law, has been withdrawn from the briefing agenda to allow a further discussion with Council at a forthcoming forum. Um, 4.12, the review of the Council Member, Kidney Member and Candidate Code of Conduct Complaint Handling Policy has been subject to a workshop with Council um, recently. Um, and Mrs Osterhoff is happy to take questions directly on that item. 4.14, um, Mr Deputy Mayor, has been again subject to a council workshop and a workshop with the Business and Tourism Working Group um, and is seeking council's endorsement um, next week to go out to um, advertising and I'm happy again to take questions on that item as well. Councillors, uh, on item 4.12, Councillor Baker. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Mr Chair. Uh, yes, uh, my question's addressed to Daniel. In short, I was not at that particular forum as you've referred to. I have had some, without going into detail, some health issues in recent weeks and months. But, uh, and of course, I can only ask you a question. But uh, are you aware that it is highly unusual and unprecedented in the Western world? This is the question, please be with me. Uh, the Western world and uh, Western democracies, uh, parliamentary democracies, republics, etc. It's highly unusual in the Western world for any judicial system to allow 
a scenario to rise whereby in a grievance, a complainant who makes a complaint against an elected member councillor, alleging a breach of the Code of Conduct, Division 3, uh, that, that, uh, and, uh, that person is entitled to be in the chamber and vote in support or against that uh, alleged uh, breach by that councillor, even though they're the complainant, and not just that, of course, as well, uh, that uh, the, uh, the respondent or the, the council responding to the allegation is also permitted to remain in the chamber and vote in respect of the guilt or innocence. Uh, uh, that's number one. Number two, are you aware that it is, in effect, a case where the complainant is a complainant but also becomes, to use the vernacular, uh, a judge, a member of the jury and a prosecutor? And for that matter, the respondent also is a uh, defence, uh, represents the defence and is also a member of the jury and is also a judge. It's just unheard of. It's just it's unprecedented. It's unprecedented anywhere that I've, that I've been able to find. I, I've stopped researching as I got to the northern areas of Europe. Yeah, uh, Councillor Baker, I'll ask the CEO to respond. Please, thank you. Um, thank you and for you, Mr Deputy Mayor. Um, no, I haven't done the extensive research that Councillor Baker is alluding to, um, but I do know the current legislation that Council needs to respond to in handling this policy does allow for that event to occur. Well, are you aware that the, are you aware as a matter of law that a pol a, that a, well, it's only a policy, it's not the law. Are you aware that as a matter of law, in the event that any principle of procedural fairness or natural justice is to be excluded in respect of any quasi or judicial process, that in those circumstances, any legislation which uh, gives rise to that policy must expressly, expressly by express words and terms, exclude in whole or in part the principles of procedural fairness and natural justice. Are you aware of that? Please. Um, for you, Mr Deputy Mayor, um, I can only reiterate my previous statement that the current policy reflects the legislation that Council is required to consider, um, yes. which is what the item presented to the briefing is addressing. And are you also aware that even though the, the policy is a policy, are you also aware that, uh, without going to specifics, in some instances, uh, without going to specifics, the policy is adhered to, uh, whereas, whereas in other circumstances the policy is disregarded, or parts of the policy are disre disregarded uh, for the purposes of uh, uh, the council acting as a quasi-judicial body when adjudicating upon the complaint or breach of the code of conduct by the by the, uh, the council, the elected member concerned, who's subject to the breach. Are you aware of that? Mr CEO. Um, for you, Mr Deputy Mayor, I, I'm not too sure what else I can add to mm. previous two statements, but um, both Kate and I would be happy to work with Councillor Baker and on any yep. amendment he wishes to progress in terms of the policy. And uh, as a further question, are you aware, of course, that the draft reviewed policy does not provide any rights of appeal, so to speak, to an elected member who's found to have uh, breached a Division Three of the code complaint? More so, yes. Are you aware of that? Mr. C. Yeah. Um, for you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, um, I might ask um, Ms. Alderstoff to expand, but I would reiterate um, both um, Ms. Alderstoff and myself are happy to work on any amendments Councillor Baker would like to um, present next week. Thank you, Thank you through you, Deputy Mayor. Kat, yeah, oh. sorry, Kate. Yes. Did, did you want? To, yeah. Um, the the Act doesn't, as the CEO has alluded to, that the policy reflects the legislation and the guidelines provided. Um, there is no appeal right, based, uh, particularly because of the nature of the complaints under Division Three. They're not intended to be seen as um, heavy legal burdens, but rather um, behavioural issues that can be resolved in a non-punitive matter. Question. So I'm just going to go to Council, uh, Councillor Nguyen. He was uh, next up, then Councillor Singale. Um, thank you. My question relates to um, standing to make an application. And in our policy, uh, that's on page 589, that's paragraph 5.1a, our policy says that any person may make a complaint within one month. I've had a check of the regulation, uh, that is section 11.1, it's the words are a person may make a complaint. So there's a difference between the use of the word a or any. And I had a quick check of the dictionary in terms of when you use any, uh, it's basically uh, intends to um, express a lack of restriction. So my question is that, um, have we expanded 
the number of or person who may make an application within the policy. Kate, did you care to respond? Um, yes, thank you. Through you, Deputy Mayor, um, no, we haven't expanded the definition. Um, any person has the right, or a person being any person, has the right to make a complaint under this legislation, and the policy reflects that. Um, I guess if the intention of Parliament, that is, to include any person, I would have thought they would have used any instead of A. And further, if I can refer you to section 12 um, of the regulation, this is 12, subsection two, it says, before making a finding in relation to the complaint, the local government must give the person to whom the complaint relates a reasonable opportunity to be heard. So when read together, regulation um, 11 and 12, that seems to limit the scope of the people who may have an interest to make an application rather than to any person who make, may make an application. That appears to be an observation, Councillor Newman. Did you have a question there? Yes, uh, how can you reconcile the two um, interpretation? Okay. Uh, thank you, through you, Deputy uh, Mayor. Um, I, I think it's more of a narrowing of a, of a question. So you, I think you've got to take the context of both those clauses into account. The first is introduction, introducing the capacity to make a complaint. The second component that you've referred to, Regulation 12.2 there, is how the respondent, uh, how the city would respond to whom the complaint has been made. So it's, it's, it's narrowed down the issue to that a person has been identified. I, I think um, a policy is intended to reflect both the, the, the legislation and also we're informed by the guidelines which make it clear that the person who is making the complaint isn't in question, it's the councillor whose conduct is under investigation. Yeah, what, what I'm saying is that the policy policy doesn't actually reflect the act because the wording has actually changed somewhat. The wording has changed from a person to any person and the meaning to that is actually very different. Through you, Deputy Chair, I don't agree, but if, if Councillor Newman would like to put forward an amendment, I'm happy to work with him on that. Yeah. I guess the concern I think uh, shared by uh, many uh, of my colleagues is any person could mean a person that's living in the United States who's heard uh, a counsellor made a comment uh, online, decides to lodge a complaint, not just one, maybe a few people about, about, about the same event. So there's this, I guess, uh, unlimited group of potential complainants, which has no interest at all um, about the conduct uh, of a counsellor. So I guess any person who makes a complaint needs to have some sort of interest. So... Again, Councillor Nguyen, they, they do seem to be observations. Do you have a question? Yes. So do you think the intention of Parliament uh, to use the word A instead of any is an indication that there's some limit to that. Uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, no, I, I don't agree with that position. Uh, again, what, what's in question is the conduct. Um, it, it, the capacity to complain about conduct is not fettered and is indeed open to anyone because who is being held to account is the council, not the person who is making the complaint. Councillor Sangali. Um, I, I would like to actually further explore something that Councillor Baker mentioned in the fact that the person who makes a complaint and the respondent can both stay in the chamber. And I guess the inference has been made that this policy only looks at councillor versus councillor, but 
but we need to remember this actually applies to public versus councillor as well. And if that's the case, the public don't have the benefit of actually being part of this discussion if a complaint was to come, because it's heard under confidential session. So I actually do agree that both the complainant and the respondent actually shouldn't be in the room, because it's only fair if it becomes a public versus council that that same fairness is shown to the member of the public. Just, and again, I, that seems to be an observation, not a question, but... Mr CEO, would you agree with that observation? Um, uh, thank you, and for you, Mr um, Deputy Mayor. Uh, the similar re response to Councillor Baker is the policy reflects the legislation. Um, whether I personally agree with the legislation, I don't have the luxury because it's power to provide advice to Council on. Um, um, Ms Alderstoff might be able to further explain, but the Act provides clear criteria as to where you can declare an interest and leave a chamber and not participate in a, in a vote. Um, and this policy reflects that, but doesn't extend further than what the regulations and the Act provide the ability for an elected member to not vote on an item. Um, Kate, I don't, I don't know if you want to expand. I, uh, I'm not disagreeing with either Councillor Baker or Councillor Sangali's comments. I'm just saying that you have legislation that the policy needs to respond to. Councillor Baker. Uh, yes, uh, can I direct, oh, perhaps I should go through this, through the CEO. Uh, are you aware that the policy we have is just that a policy, uh, and it's a policy that we're required to have by virtue of legislation, in particular regulations, but the regulations don't stipulate the actual words in the code of conduct at all. That's left to the discretion of the council. That there is no mandatory code of conduct. This, are you aware that this, code and the policy uh, are not enshrined in legislation at all. All the legislation is says is you will have a code of conduct and you will have a policy. That's all it says. It doesn't say, uh, well, are you aware of that? Because that, that is, well, I don't mean to, I'm not going to be critical of it, but that is the truth. And I'll, 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 the second, next question, I think we'll get to the bottom of the matter. Please. Are you aware of that? Mr. CEO. Um, uh, for you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Um, Yes, I'm aware of the legislation in terms of both the role of a policy, um, yep. the role of the legislation and the code of conduct. I might ask Kate just to expand in terms of the, the code of conduct question. Uh, and is it supplementary? Would, oh, would you like works. my answer, Councillor Baker? Yeah, so um, I suppose uh, you, your question straddles two components of the legislation. Um, the regulations do dictate how um, complaints are to be handled and has an expectation placed on elect um, councils on how that happens. You're right, there is a capacity to adopt and amend the model code of conduct, but the city has chosen to adopt it. And if I can, has the city ever briefed a specialist senior council, QC, as to whether the terms of the policy and the complaints handling procedure in any way breach any principle of procedural fairness and natural justice, particularly given that the accuser and the, uh, and, the, uh, and the accused get to sit on the trial, act as the judge, act as the jury, and vote whichever way they think they should vote, which is pretty obvious which way they'd vote. I mean, it just strikes me as being, well, it, I'll be polite, it's bizarre, bizarre. Um, for you, uh, Mr Deputy Mayor, um, can I maybe separate the, the question from the policy? So the, the policy has a lot of clauses and a lot of criteria. I think Councillor Baker is, is really, um, asking a question that, from memory, the City um, Council in its adopted submission on the legislation and the local government reform have already highlighted um, to the Minister and the Department this um, problematic piece of legislation in terms of Council being involved in being the complainant and, and having to deal with it and vote on it. So um, if Council wanted to get senior QC advice, uh, I think it might reflect partly what Council's already made in its submission. Um, I think it's a known problematic piece of legislation. Councillor Baker. Sorry, uh, you may not be aware of this, but I've got to obviously draft a, I'll give you a question. Uh, are you aware that I've spoken to many senior lawyers who've examined the policy and have said that the policy and the procedure in effect creates a de facto potential star chamber kang and kangaroo court and also can result in very serious perversions of the course of attempted, well, until discovered, attempted perversions of the course of justice, in that the city is purporting to act as a quasi-judicial body, a quasi-judicial body, and yet it is breaching every principle of procedural fairness and natural justice. 
Are you aware of that? Um, uh, forgive me, Mr. Deputy Mayor. I'm not aware of the discussion with Council Baker's had with um, legal counsel because that's been between Council Baker and legal counsel. Um, but uh, I can ask Kate if she wishes to expand on. I think the, the issue that Council has expressed concern in submissions to the Department of Local Government through the reform process, uh, I, I'll, I'd seek confirmation from Council Baker. It's, it's the same concern he's expressing today as what has been expressed by Council in the submission to the Minister. Uh, well, it's, it's, it, it is related, yes, for ob obvious reasons. It's the most glaring. You give that document to any lawyer and say, what do you think of this? Where does this originate from? Russia? Cuba? Where, where did this come from? This is in Monterey. It was a suburb up the road. You're kidding me. Anyhow, that's the, that's the considered decision of the elected members, so be it. Councillor Baker. Another question. Do the same rules apply, for example, if an employee of the city or a director or a senior staff member is charged with breaching the code of conduct can they uh, sit in upon uh, at their own hearing and vote as to whether they should be disciplined or not, uh, and uh, vote as to if they are to be disciplined, what uh, penalty they should receive? Does the same does the same apply to council directors, staff, and employees, or they, do they have a different set of rules? And if they are different, to what extent are they different? I'll um, I'll ask the CEO to respond, but bearing in mind, of course, we are talking specifically about council member, committee member and candidate code of conduct, given the uh, employment contracts of staff members, directors and or the CEO, I suggest they're probably largely different. There are separate processes, but Mr CEO? If I could just to clarify, you might be right, I don't know, that's why I'm asking the question, but is it a case where there's, there's two rules? There's the old two rule rule and they're different, different rules. Um, I'm free, Mr Deputy Mayor. Council is governed by the Local Government Act and is an elected body of council. Employees are governed by different legislation in terms of their employment relations and the way discipline and disputes are, are managed and handled. It's, it's not a, a voting type environment that handles staff investigations. I think the principal, um, um, for you, Mr Deputy Mayor, in terms of answering a, a question, I. I think Councillor Baker is just alluding to, I would imagine, under the Act for every other decision that Council makes, if an elected member is conflicted, they must declare an interest in accordance with the Act and leave the Chamber. And I think Councillor Baker is just highlighting um, the potential hypocrisy of this piece of legislation, which doesn't treat the decision-making form of Council, it treats it in a different way to all the other aspects that Council is required to decide. I, I think that is what Councillor Baker is alluding to, which is applied throughout the state under this legislation. And I think yes. there's no, I think there's broadly no general disagreement. But Councillor Baker, you had another question? Uh, no. So actually, I think you've used up your word quota uh, this evening, Councillor Baker. <laughs> and that was just in jest. <laughs> Councillor Nguyen. Um, just in relation to the mediation uh, point, that's at 5.5, uh, where um, if a party um, does not wish to engage in mediation, must provide written reasons or detailed reasons why mediation is not possible or appropriate. Um, what's the purpose of providing reasons if they don't want to participate simply because they don't want to? Um, uh, for you, Mr Deputy Mr. Mayor, yeah. um, I think that reflects a discussion that Council had in framing this policy for a workshop. Um, I might ask Kate if there's any other context that I'm forgetting, but I think that was a reflection of the discussion Council asked to have framed within the draft policy that's before you. Uh, yeah, I concur with that. Thank you, Sarah. I have nothing further to add. I guess the concern is it, um, that the um, complaint administrator may um, assess uh, it negatively against the whoever doesn't wish to participate. Uh, and then I guess that, that is the concern. Um, and again, that I hate to repeat myself and I'll just, and I, I just say this respectfully, that appears to be an opinion. Do you have a question? Um, I, the, the, the question, is there a purpose for elicit, uh, trying to elicit uh, the reason behind someone who doesn't want to participate. Mr CEO. 
um, uh, for you, Mr. Mayor, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Um, I can only reflect on the discussions from that council asked to be reflected in this policy. Um, I, I would imagine it was just to provide some further understanding um, through the complaint process as to why mediation was not followed. I mm. guess council is seeking to have some context provided um, within the decision. Um, again, um, this is council's policy. And I, can't, I think Councillor Baker alluded to that in some of his questions. Then is. Uh, Council can make amendments to get it to a point where you're satisfied it reflects what Council wants in this matter. Sure. Um, at 5.7, dismissal of a complaint where if the behaviour was dealt with by the Mayor, um, if a complaint is made against the Mayor, who would be the person that deals with that issue? Can I be of assistance? Ca no, thank Very you, good. Councillor Baker. Um, Kate, did you wish to uh, offer a view? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, de through you, um, Deputy Mayor, um, the Local Government Act allows the Deputy Mayor to step in and in a situation where the Mayor is unable or unwilling to perform her fu uh, his or her functions. Um, um, and this section was lifted almost directly from the regulations itself. <coughs> Just a follow-up on that. Um, so if a complaint is made against the mayor, would who would chair that meeting? Would the mayor herself or his, himself, whoever that may be? Can I please answer the question? Ca ca no, Councillor Baker. Um, Councillor Newen, are you specifically referring to the mediation? Uh, no, this is in the context of determining the complaint after we receive the report from the complaint administrator. Yeah. Kate, do you have any uh, clarification on that point? Uh, yes, perhaps if I can cl um, clarify, Deputy Mayor, thank you. Um, so this particular dismissal capacity, as I said, is lifted from the regulations. It allows a dismissal before further investigation is undertaken when it is um, when a situation has arisen where the mayor has dealt with behaviour actually in that meeting. So it's not something that would happen afterwards. There would be no separate chairing of that meeting, if I've understood your question correctly. It, it might be a situation, for example, um, they may p pull a councillor up and ask for an apology there and then, and that would be considered dealt with in the moment. Um, uh, to the extent that that would be something that would happen after the fact, it's, this isn't what this provision provides for. Apologise. Um, um, I've sort of moved on to the next stage of the complaint um, process, where um, uh, the investigation has been carried out, report has been um, provided, and it's gone to council for uh, determination um, with what a recommendation. And this is, for example, in relation to um, um, the mayor. Um, so, who would be chairing that meeting? Um, if a complaint is made against a mayor? I might, I might refer to the CEO, if that's okay for, for, to answer that question. I think this probably takes us back to Councillor Baker's original yep. um, question. So just to speed things up. Well, I, I can, it would be the mayor, because unless um, a standing order amendment is progressed to help us address this issue. Um, and that's why we've, we're trying to run the, to, to, to run, we've got this issue of trying to balance the policy and then the amendment to the standing orders to bring um, some of these issues in a more manageable way. Can, Councillor Baker. Yes, uh, to the CEO. Is the CEO aware that in the event that the mayor is the subject of the complaint, under the rules, it says very clearly, she shall, oh, sorry, he or she shall, number one, vacate the chair. Number two, the deputy mayor shall be the presiding chairperson of the meeting. Number three, all staff directors are to leave the chamber. And if I'm wrong, Kate, tell me I'll pay you a lot. I'll pay two thousand dollars cash when we leave here tonight. Two thousand bucks in your hand. If I'm wrong, are you aware of that? That's the question. And also, it doesn't say what happens in the event there's a breach. Yes. In other words, if the person concerned does not vacate the chair and remains in the chamber and votes. 
I mean, I, I, if, 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 you, if you, this was a news item on TV, people would not believe that this this is this is justice, so to speak, under our code of conduct. That, it's it's yeah. anyway, I'll, I thank, won't say anything further. Thank, very thank you, Councillor Baker, Mr. CEO. Um, thank you, and for you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Um, I know um, our previous exec manager of legal and governance provided has already provided advice to council on the linkages between the um, complaints handling policy the procedure and the standing orders in the interrelationship between the amendments to the standing orders, the adoption of the revised policy and the sequence that those need to occur to enable some of these things to flow through all three documents. Um, I'm happy to provide that advice again. I hesitate to ask. Uh, oh, Councillor Miles. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to put a couple of things on, on record. Um, if I just go back to, and I did ask this in a previous meeting, um, in the item of anybody can put in a complaint, uh, does that mean any living person in the world who listens to us online can put in a complaint? Is that correct? Kate, did you want to provide clarity on that? Um, yes, through you, Deputy um, Mayor, um, that's correct. Uh, my, my, second, uh, my second question was, if after a complaint has been processed and it's before the council in a closed session, of course, um, and it has to have a mover and a seconder to bring that item uh, onto the agenda and obviously to, to talk about that item, if it fails for a mover and a seconder, uh, is that deemed to have dealt with that item? Mr CEO. Um, through you, Mr Deputy Mayor. No, I don't believe so, because the legislation requires you to make a determination, and I don't think it lapsing um, has actually made a decision. I don't think that's any different to um, when we have other, um, for example, planning applications that um, the officer's recommendation is not carried and there is no alternative um, dealt with on the night. Administration then needs to bring it back to council to get a, a, a decision. Um, I might ask Kate if she has a, a different view. Uh, no, uh, no. Uh, just to follow, and I know these are hypothetical, I just want to put them out there because it could happen. Um, in the event that there's only 14 people in the room and the item is then dealt with on a 7-7 basis, does that mean it's been dealt with, CEO? Uh, CEO? I, I would imagine if it's 7-7, seven, seven, the mayor would then need to exercise a casting vote. So if it was six, seven? So what I'm trying to get at, if it was an equal vote, has that, has that dealt with the definition of what we're being told by the minister um, about this regulation? Um, through you, Mr um, Deputy Mayor. Um, if it's six, seven, then a decision would be made because you would have, it would be lost. So the council would have made a decision. I don't believe the decision on the complaints has to be by an absent majority. I think it needs to just be by a simple majority. So a, a decision has been made. And but Very guess, different to it lapsing for, not a, for want of a move or a second. And I guess my final uh, issue, and I guess we can maybe uh, do an amendment or something on this, um, has there been any discussion that you're aware of, CEO, that, and, and Walga probably needs to do this, that it needs to be challenged in the Supreme Court on behalf of local government and councils, that this legislation is clearly not fit for purpose? Um, for you, uh, Mr Deputy Mayor, um, I know both myself and Mrs Jennings have made strong representation to the department on the problematic nature of this legislation and also the overlap between this um, legislation and the Division 4 standards panel legislation. Um, Council has made a submission to both Walga and the department. Um, I would be happy to assist in drafting any amendment if Council wishes to further reinforce Council's concern over the legislation. Um, I, I think we all concur. So. I, I guess what I'm asking is, because uh, uh, I think it needs to come from Walga, maybe Walga should be challenging this legislation in the Supreme Court 
as that that it is clearly uh, uh, fails on a number of levels to do with um, uh, dealing with complaints. And until somebody has challenged it at that level, uh, so the, the minister uh, obviously has to defend his regulations and the Act, um, uh, we're not going to do it as a single council, and they know that. But I think if, if we present the argument to the CEO of Walga or to the president of Walga um, to maybe uh, to do that challenge, um, have you had any discussions in that area? Um. Uh, for you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I think if if the if the question Councillor Miles is asking, I would be happy to assist in drafting an amendment that would enable Council to adopt such a position and 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 instruct for Walga both through State Council and to the Chief Executive. Councillor Baker, uh, yes, your you, uh, your arm must be getting sore down there. Beg your pardon, sir. Your arm must be getting sore. I apologise on the deaf as well. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Now, Councillor Baker, you have a call. With well, my mask, I was just looking for my exemption. I, th I think I left it at home, but uh, I'll bring a photocopy next week. All right, sorry, I apologise. Um, Mr CEO, are you aware that uh, in terms of the disciplinary uh, proceedings of the Council when dealing with Division 3 complaints against elected members, that the city, uh, that the, the elected members constitute the quasi-judicial decision-making body? Are you aware of that? Yes? Yes? I'll continue on. Just wait. Um, Are you aware that the decision is made at a special council meeting? Are you aware that the practice of this city is to go behind closed doors? And are you aware that the practice of the city is also not to record, have an audio recording of those proceedings? And are you aware that the minister has said that under the new act, when promulgated, win, lose or draw by hook or by crook, every council meeting must and shall be recorded? And if you look at the rationale behind that, because there needs to be a record of what was said rather than people taking notes, and that the minutes of that meeting will include who said what. The best set of minutes for any meeting is a 100 per cent audio record. That's the best set of minutes you can possibly have. That's my view. They, what is said is said, just like what's happening here tonight. I think the audio system still working. It's getting a bit late. But uh, anyhow, are you aware of those matters, please, Mr CEO? Mr CEO. Um, uh, I think for you, Mr Deputy Mayor, I'm aware that Council handles these matters in accordance with their policy. So Council has a policy in terms of what meetings are recorded and not recorded, and that policy is followed by administration. Complaints handling is handled in accordance with Council's policy, and that determines how the matter is handled. But uh, uh, supplementary, are you aware that in terms of the policy, the policy says, yes, the behind closed door session in respect of the adjudication of a complaint, a Division 3 complaint, uh, can be recorded if, council, if the councillors so resolve. But of course, if it goes to a vote and the, and the, the majority of councillors votes that the proceedings not be recorded, then under the current policy, uh, they will not be recorded. There will be no audio record of the meeting. There'll be no notes to refer to. There, there are no minutes. The only minutes that are published, uh, the only minutes is, or the only minute is the actual resolution that was passed. That, that, that's, that's all the public gets to see. So they don't know what goes on behind closed doors. Ca not, Councillor, not, not can Baker. I make a point of order? Yeah, so that's, we're not in that. Councillor Baker, yes. um, I, I have raised the same issue with uh, Councillor Nguyen. They are opinions, if you have a question. No, I was asking you... him as, as to whether he was aware. Are you aware of this? Are you aware of that? Are you aware of this? So that's a question I should have uh, to raise my... The, well, there, there were a range aware. of suppositions there, but oh, no, Council, Councillor Huntley. But the facts, pure facts. Councillor Huntley. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor. I, I just wanted to raise a point of order in the fact that we have discussed this through and through and through. So whether this is just because someone wants to put this on the record, I'm not sure. But this has been dealt with. We have had long, long discussions and hours and hours of discussions. We know there are flaws in these rules and we have to accept uh, a certain amount of them. Actually, Councillor Huntley, as much as I absolutely agree with you, I'd have to say I'm ruling that out of order as a point of order, because it's not. Yeah, sorry. But, but, <laughs> but it is, they are valid comments. Thank you. At the risk of asking a silly question, are there any more questions on this item, councillors? <laughs> Sorry, only that I'll speak to the CEO about possible... Yeah. Uh, Thank you, Councillor Miles. Mr CEO. Um, 
um, for you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, um, and I, I was just um, perhaps expanding on Councillor Miles' closing comments. Um, this is your policy. Um, we've worked on several workshops to try to address um, the amendments you've asked for, and I think we are at a point where both Noel and Kate and myself are more than happy to assist in drafting any amendments to the policy that addresses any further concerns Council has so that we can um, continue to have a policy that reflects how Council wants these matters to be dealt with. Councillor Baker. Yes, I, I, have a, I have a question to the CEO. Wouldn't you agree that it would be more prudent in the circumstances, rather than making a submission to well and waiting a year or six months for a response, that we can go it alone, uh, we can brief Council to give legal advice as to a senior Council as to whether this particular policy offends the, the principles of procedural fairness and natural justice in any respect or regard, which it clearly does, uh, and also whether, that is, that, that is, whether or not that is lawful in the circumstances on the basis that the legislation uh, used express words to expressly exclude the principles of procedural fairness and natural justice, which it didn't. I think that would be the best way to go. We'll get a definitive answer. If other councillors want to look at our advice, uh, and assuming their models are sim their code models are similar to ours, we can charge them on a fee of five hundred dollars rather than waiting for Wilga because it, I don't think it will happen. I don't think it will happen. Uh, what about that idea, Ca Councillor? Um, if I'll and I won't go to the uh, the CEO. I think we've done this to death with respect, and I think Councillor Humpy was quite right. Um, it is coming before Council next week, and there's ample opportunity to discuss that when it when it comes up next Tuesday. Unless there's no further comments, councillors will move on. Uh, that will take us to item 4.14, because 4.13 has been withdrawn. 4.14, are there any questions? Councillor Wright, you are... Thank you definitely want to extend this evening. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. And I'm terribly sorry to every member of the public gallery that is still here and online. Um, I know we've talked enough about interest, but I have to dis, uh, declare my impartiality interest in this item in relation to 4.14, Draft Economic Development Strategy 22 to 2032, as I am a fee-paying member of the Wanneroo Business, uh, Wanneroo Business Association. Um, and as a consequence, there may be a perception that my impartiality on this matter will be uh, may be affected. I declare that I'll consider this matter on its merits and next week vote accordingly. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Um, any other further questions on this item, councillors? There are none. That moves us on to item five, motions on notice for next week. We have two motions on notice. Uh, they will be circulated with the uh, agenda papers. Item six is late reports to be circulated under separate cover. There is nil. Item seven. Public question time. I believe we have two that have already been submitted in writing and they've been responded to. Are there any any members of the please you uh, if you could just join us at the lectern again? Yeah. So the questions that we've uh, received are from Mrs. D. Newton in, uh, in Wanneroo, and that's on the warrant of payments, and Ms. M. Kwok of Ocean Reef. Thank you. And if you could, uh, again, just state your name and address for our records. If you could just state your name and address for our records. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, did you hear that? Yeah. yeah. All right, my, my first question is whether or not Council is aware that the ASP 70 structure plan, which is the structure plan applicable to the Woolworths proposal in Two Rocks, has been substantially changed since it was publicly consulted upon and that which was subsequently approved by Council in 2010. If Council was not aware of that before tonight, it is now. Um, second question is, is Council aware of any other means other than by online, which I note can be prohibitive and discriminatory, that public submissions can be made in relation to proposed development applications or local heritage surveys, and are Council open to establishing other more inclusive processes? 
Uh, and just from my perspective, I think the answer to that question about inclusive processes is uh, always a live option for council, always looking for uh, better ways of engaging with the community. Uh, Mr Dixon, did you have any comments to make on that? Thank you. We'll take that on notice. Uh, my next question is, uh, is the council aware that under ASP 70 it states that the city will not approve development without a detailed area plan approved by the city unless the city is satisfied that the development is of a scale and permanence that would not prejudice the design of the detailed area plan, the timely provision of infrastructure to the area or the development of the surrounding area? And are you aware that the that a detailed area plan was not approved by the city before it recommended approval of the Woolworths proposal. Uh, Mr Dixon. Um, through you, Chair. Uh, yes, I think that information, I, I will confirm that that information is contained within, or partly contained within the responsible authority report, but I will confirm that that is the case. Thank you, Mr Dixon. Only two more, I promise. Um, would the impact on a nearby public place be a planning consideration? And if so, would, um, would Finney removing the statues from another public place not have a negative effect on that place? And has this been considered? Mr Dixon? Uh, I'll take that question on notice. Thank you. Last question is in relation to the ASP 70 um, more broadly, and would Council consider reviewing and amending ASP 70 to provide a more acceptable outcome for the community for any future development in the area? Um, and I suppose my, my note there is in relation to public consultation, considering the ASP 70 was, I suppose, deliberated in the 2000s and no public consultation has occurred since then. Mr Dixon. Um, through you, Chair, uh, administration would be happy if instructed by council to review the structure plan. Thank you. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you for your questions. Are there any further questions from the gallery, please? And just again, it's uh, your name and address for the records. Thank you. Um, Angie Rayson, Monroe. This is with regard to the Council adopting an advocacy position statement called COVID-19 vaccination pro-choice statement. Couple of questions. Who recommended no action to be taken? And was that recommenda recommendation adopted with reportable due dil diligence and review? Mr CEO. Um, thank you for you, Mr Deputy Mayor. Um, the report says presented to Council this evening are with my endorsement as Chief Executive Officer and all have been considered with due diligence. And reportable or demonstratable? Uh, the reports aim to provide the demonstration that supports the recommendations. Was any um, consideration, sorry, was any consultation completed with constituents, and if so, with whom? Mr. CEO. Um, thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, and thank you for the question. Um, so the process that has been followed is um, council has engaged with their electors through the special electors meeting, so that's a consultation that is driven by the electors, um, and then council now will consider the consultation driven by the electors and then make a decision based on the resolutions passed. So um, in this process, engagement's actually driven by the electors providing their position and view to council and council considers the view expressed by the electors through the meeting. So it's, it's different to where council is seeking feedback from electors. This one, the electors is providing feedback directly to council. And you can confirm that there will be a decision made at the next council meeting? The, the item, I, I can confirm the item will be listed for discussion, debate and decision uh, at next Tuesday's council meeting. Lovely. Thank you very much. Are there any further questions from the gallery? Oh, please, yes. Um, and again, I know it's Ocean Reef, 
but, but name and address for the, for the records, please. Um, Michelle Quirk, 15, Crawford Elbow, Ocean Reef. Um, is this um, including statement time as well? No, unfortunately not this evening. No, that's all right. Thank you. But can I just say, I think you absolutely get the record for fitting in as many words as you possibly could have done inside of seven minutes. Uh, it, was, it was impressive. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Council. Are there any further questions from the gallery? There being none, we then move on to item eight, confidential. There is nil. Item nine, date of next council meeting. The ordinary council meeting uh, is scheduled for Tuesday, the 12th of April, 2022, at 6 p.m. in the Council Chambers, 23 Dundabar Road, Wanneroo, item 10, closure. Uh, I declare the meeting closed at 10.40. Thank you, everyone, for attending.